Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> I am uh, Council Member Vincent Gentile. I'm sitting in this morning for a while for the chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises, Councilman Donovan Richards. We're joined here today by our speaker, a speaker of Melissa Mark Viverito, as well as Council Member Richie Torres and other members that will be joining us. Today we will be holding hearings on two applications and voting on several applications that we laid over from our last meeting. We will move on first to today's hearings. We will start with a hearing on the ECF East 96th Street development and move on to a hearing on the Baychester Square application as our second hearing. The ECF East 96th Street project LU 700 through 703 is an application for a zoning map amendment, zoning text amendment, and two special permits to facilitate the development <coughs> I'm sorry, of a full block site located between 1st Avenue, 2nd Avenue, East 96th Street, and East 97th Street in the Speaker's District. This is a joint application submitted by the New York City Educational Construction Fund and Avalon Bay Communities Incorporated. This site is currently occupied by the Co-op Tech High School and uh, Mark's Brothers Playground. The rezoning action would map the area as an R10 slash C2-8 zone. <clears throat> the text amendment would establish the area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area and permit the waiver of lot coverage requirements. And the two special permits would allow for modifications of bulk regulations and a waiver of off-street parking requirements. These actions would facilitate a mixed-use development containing 990,000 square feet of residential space, space for three new public high schools, and retail. The developer would also reconstruct the existing playground, which would be relocated to a different part of the same block. I will now open the hearing for LU 700, 701, 702, and 703. As I said, this project is in the Speaker's District, so we will begin with a statement from our speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito. Thank you, Council Member Gentile, for, um, for stepping in and, and chairing this committee hearing, subcommittee hearing. Just going to make very brief remarks and definitely look forward to the testimony and then any, any questions that um, will result out of that. So uh, clearly I'm here today to listen to testimony of the public uh, on the important project in my district, the Education Construction Fund and Avalon Bay will be partnering to develop space for three existing local schools, all of with substantial needs for a new space. Heritage High School is an overcrowded school using 136% of the building's capacity, occupying space in a cultural center, what was formerly an elementary school, now being used by a high school, and it does not have a gym. Park East High School is in a space des designed to be a music school and includes small rooms with walls positioned at odd angles. Uh, these are two schools that are in the neighborhood and are performing uh, well and obviously are extremely limited by the constraints that the existing spaces offer them. Co-op Tech uh, is using an outdated facility to teach our children the trades for the 21st century. So these three schools will get new state-of-the-art facilities funded by this project, uh, not the School Construction Authority. And I think if, if reporting is accurate, uh, we have not seen any sort of high school built in the East Harlem area in close to 50 years. Uh, while the project will rebuild and enhance an existing public park and develop much needed affordable housing, community stakeholders have called for the development of housing with deeper levels of affordability, which I would like to see included in the proposed development in addition to specific local hiring commitments, both on construction and post-construction employment. I also do have serious concerns, as other, others have expressed, about the proposed scale and height of the building. The residential tower would be the tallest structure in my community and one of the tallest in the Upper East Side. Many residents in both communities have expressed serious concerns and need direct response from ECF and Avalon Bay at this hearing. So again, I appreciate uh, the uh, ECF being here and Avalon Bay representatives. I definitely look forward to hearing the testimony and I will have a couple of questions after that. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. So we'll we begin with our first panel already seated uh, from uh, the Education Construction Fund. We have Jennifer Maldonado and from the Avalon Bay Communities Incorporated, 
We have uh, Martin Piedzulia, uh, John Vogel, and Ken Lowenstein. If you could um, decide who goes first, sure. and I'll, then I'll uh, start. Okay, uh, and good. just uh, just Introduce identify myself. yourself sure. before you speak. Uh, good morning. I am Jennifer Maldonado, and I am the executive director of the New York City Educational Construction Fund, also known as ECF. ECF was organized in 1967 and is governed by a three-member board of trustees, the chairman of which is Schools Chancellor Farina. The organization has sponsored projects since 1967 that have added 18,000 school seats, 4,500 market rate and affordable housing units, and 1.2 million square feet of office space to New York City neighborhoods. I'm here today to present and answer questions on our ECF project at 96th Street. The project would be constructed on the full block site of East 96th and 97th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues. The site is the current home of New York City's Co-op Tech School, which is a career and technical education school, and the Marx Brothers Playground, a DOE jointly operated playground. Also here with me today are Martin Piazzola, Senior Vice President of Avalon Bay Communities, and John Vogel, Vice President of Avalon Bay, who will also be part of our formal presentation. As I said, by way of background, ECF was created in 1967 by the New York State Legislature as a financing and development vehicle of the New York City Department of Education. Its sole purpose is to construct public school facilities for DOE's exclusive exclusive use by leveraging private funding. Under Article 10 of the Education Law, ECF is authorized to lease air rights above public schools for 75 to 99 years. ECF can only develop on municipally owned parcels of land. ECF does not receive budget appropriations from the federal, state, or local government. 100% of ECF's revenues are derived from ground rents and tax equivalency payments from private developers. The ground lease between ECF and the developer requires the developer to make annual payments of rent and tax equivalency and also requires the developer to construct new public school facilities that meet the requirements of the Department of Education. ECF's Co-op Tech project at East 96th Street presents a unique development opportunity to build three new high schools in East Harlem. These would be the first public high school buildings built in East Harlem in over 50 years. These schools are the anchor of the overall project that will also include a residential apartment tower with over 300 units of permanent affordable housing, retail uses, and the reconstruction and modernization of the Marx Brothers Playground. These school buildings will be the new homes of Co-op Tech, Park East High School, and Heritage High School, schools that have been part of East Harlem for decades. Again, these schools will be built with no capital or expense outlay from the city of New York. Across New York City, there is a need for new modern school buildings with ample space and up-to-date classrooms. The building limitations and constraints in the current Co-op Tech, Park East, and Heritage High School buildings do not allow for the schools to offer adequate career and technical instruction in those trades that provide real career opportunities for students. CTE instructions such as welding and carpentry now have significant waiting lists as each only has one workshop. In the case of Heritage and Park East High Schools, both have space constraints, lack appropriate gymnasiums, auditoriums, and libraries. Neither school has outdoor recreational space. Kevin McCarthy, the principal of Park East High School, will provide testimony on behalf of the schools. As to the Heritage High School, its relocation will provide the added benefit of allowing for the expansion of the Julia de Burgos Latino Cultural Center, a significant local resource. Replacing these three buildings with facilities that have all the amenities required for 21st century education will cost approximately $300 million. And the current capital, and the current SCA capital plan does not include funding for an investment of this size. But we have found a partner in Avalon Bay, a real estate developer with a proven track record that is ready, willing, and able to make such an investment in our public schools. Over the last several years, ECF has engaged with Speaker Mark Viverito's staff, 
Foxborough President Brewer and other elected officials, New York City agencies, Community Board 11, and community stakeholders to address the community's specific request for any proposed project. Those requests included new East Harlem schools, significant permanent affordable housing, economic development, job training, and employment opportunity for East Harlem residents. With this project, ECF and Avalon Bay can together achieve these goals. Avalon Bay proposes to build a development that will include the three new high school facilities, over 1,000 rental apartments, with 30% of those units being per permanently affordable, ground floor retail that supports the neighborhood, and the rehabilitation of Marx Brothers Playground. This proposal is a tremendous step forward for East Harlem High Schools, while also providing other significant public amenities. My colleagues at Avalon Bay will provide more detailed information on the project. But first, I want to address the rehabilitation of Marx Brothers Playground. The Marx Brothers Playground was opened in 1947 as a jointly operated playground for the use of the then Machine and Metal Trades High School, which is now Co-op Tech. JOP's jointly operated playgrounds were established to assist both the Department of Education and the Parks Department to meet their mutual goals of providing playground space to students and also neighboring communities where playgrounds were not being utilized by the adjacent schools. Currently, there are more than 250 JOPs throughout the five boroughs. Historically, in the case of Marx Brothers Playground, schools have, used the, have use of the athletic field until 4 p.m. on weekdays during the school year, and the children's play area is open to the public all day. Under the JOP model, the playground is operated by the school during school hours and by the Parks Department after schools and weekends. The Marx Brothers Playground has, as I said, has been a JOP since 1947 and has always, has always been held in the jurisdiction of the Department of Education. At the moment, it's also held jointly with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. It's always been located within a designated zoning district and has generated floor area. In 2004, the Marx Brothers Playground was alienated by the state legislature to allow staging for the MTA's Second Avenue subway construction. While legislation, while legislation is not typically needed for JOPs, this 2000, this alienation, les, I'm sorry, while legislation is not typically needed for JOPs, this 2017 alienation le legislation was necessary because the 2004 legislation incorrectly identified the playground as parkland, although it is neither mapped as parkland nor in the jurisdiction of the Parks Department. After passage of a home rule resolution by this council, the state legislature approved the alienation legislation on June 21, 2017. The alienation legislation also allows the city to convey the block, including the Marx Brothers Playground, to ECF which will lease a portion of the site for Avalon Bay for residential and retail uses and a portion of the site to DOE for the schools. The balance of the site will be developed as a replacement playground, which will again be operated by the DOE and the Parks Department as a jointly operated playground, but not ma mapped as parkland. Additionally, in keeping with state alienation requirements, the City of New York will dedicate an equal amount or equal amount to or greater than the fair market value of the parkland being discontinued toward the acquisition of new parkland or towards capital improvements to existing parkland and recreational facilities within the borough of Manhattan. We've been working very closely with the Parks Department to ensure that the new playground meets the needs of the schools and the broader community. We continue to work with the community to address their concerns regarding the playground closure during the construction period and our partners at Avalon Bay have committed to assisting with the rehabilitation of nearby Stanley Isaacs Parks. I'm joined today by colleagues from the Parks Department who can answer any playground-related questions. ECF and the DOE are very enthusiastic about this project. This project provides an opportunity to build new schools in East Harlem while also meeting other important public needs and objectives including permanent affordable housing, community serving retail, and local employment opportunities. Thank you for your time, and I'd like to introduce Martin Piazzola, Senior Vice President at Avalon Bay, who will speak further about these topics. Thank you, Jennifer, and good morning. My name is Martin Piazzola. I oversee development for Avalon Bay in New York City. As mentioned, 
This development project encompasses an entire city block, with the Co-op Tech School occupying the eastern half of the block and the Marx Brothers Playground occupying the western portion. The overall massing of the development is dictated by and large by the various and sizable community benefits. The phasing of the project is dictated by the need to first build the replacement Co-op Tech School, which will be located along East 97th Street near 2nd Avenue. The size of the footprint of the new Co-op Tech School is a function of the targeted overall size of 135,000 square feet, coupled with the need to limit the height to nine floors. It should be noted that two of the school building lower floors extend under the residential building in order to help limit the overall height of the school building. Once the new expanded Co-op Tech School is built and occupied, the existing Co-op Tech School building on the east side of the block can be demolished and work will then commence on the second school building. This second school building will accommodate the Heritage High School and Park East High School. The size of the second school building's footprint is a, f is a function of three factors. The first being the various school uses, including gymnasium, auditorium, library, cafeteria, etc. Second factor is the height of the building, which is dictated by SEA requirements to limit travel distances for students. And the third factor is the targeted overall size of 135,000 square feet. It is worth noting that the three newly built schools will exceed the size of the three existing school buildings by nearly 60% and will be the first newly built schools in East Harlem in 50 years, as previously mentioned. A brand new replacement playground will also be built to the same size and configuration of the existing playground and will once again occupy roughly one half of the entire block, this time to be located midway between 1st and 2nd Avenue. This new $8 million playground with funding from Avalon Bay and ECF will replace the existing playground, which hasn't seen any capital improvements in over 20 years. Additionally, any resources made available once the MTA leaves the staging area are earmarked for the playground improvements. The newly constructed and upgraded playground will be operated as a JOP as it had before. Now the residential component will be built on the remaining parcel of land that is not occupied by the pl new playground and the two new schools. Could you change the slide? The residential building will consist of 63 stories totaling between 1,000 and 1,100 apartments designed with one entrance and one lobby on East 96th Street. 30% of the units will be set aside for permanent affordable housing, with one-third of such affordable units targeted to households earning no more than 40% of AMI. The rents for the approximately 100 apartments in the 40% AMI band would be between $629 per month and $938 per month, depending on the size of the apartment. The remaining 200 or so affordable apartments would be set aside for households at or below 60% and 110% of AMI. Slide two. Uh, we'll go back. Back, back, back. Thank you. Uh, it is worth highlighting the fact that the proposed 30% affordability level exceeds the level required under M mandatory inclusionary housing, known as MIH. Next slide, please. The development will also include a retail component totaling roughly 20,000 square feet located on the ground level and the second level. Next slide. It is our intention to lease a portion of the second floor retail space at a below market rate to one or more East Harlem retail operators. Next slide. One more. Now for the financing of this project. ECF and Avalon Bay will not tap into New York City capital dollars to finance this approximately $950 million project. The schools are estimated to cost roughly 250 to 300 million. The affordable housing component is estimated at 192 million, and the playground, again, is estimated at 8 million for a total of roughly $500 million in community benefits. The other residential and retail components total roughly 450 million. ECF will use ground lease payment and tax equivalency payment obligations documented in a ground lease with Avalon Bay 
to finance the cost of the two school buildings and will use the cash payments received under the ground lease agreement to fund the debt service of the school facility bonds. Effectively, all of the funding for the community benefits totaling roughly $500 million is from private investment. The project does not qualify for HBD housing subsidies and again does not utilize any New York City capital funding. To make the project economically feasible, given the sizable level of community benefits being provided, namely three new schools, a new 64,000 square foot playground, and a 30% permanently affordable housing component, the residential building has to be a certain size. And given all of the site constraints described and dictated by the community benefits, the residential component needs to be a certain height as well. In short, for the project to be feasible, the residential component must be the size and height as proposed. At this time, I'd like to introduce John Vogel, Vice President of Avalon Bay, who will speak <coughs> further about the topic of local employment. Thanks, Marty. Uh, good morning. I'm John Vogel from Avalon Bay Communities. I'll be speaking about the, uh, the need for local employment opportunities within East Harlem. If you could advance two slides, that's it. Um, Avalon Bay knows, as a responsible developer, that this issue is very important. Building permanent affordable housing, open space, and three new schools in East, Har in East Harlem are all very meaningful, but we will have missed an opportunity if we don't simultaneously focus on how we can provide construction and permanent job opportunities to those members of the East Harlem community that are able to contribute to this effort. We will, of, of course, utilize existing city job placement infrastructure, such as Hire NYC, to connect jobs with those seeking jobs, but we also want to go beyond that. With the speaker's guidance and, and an effort to maximize local construction employment, we have met with many local not-for-profit community-based labor organizations, including Strive, Positive Workforce, and Youth Action, Youth Build. Our goal is to develop partnerships with these organizations to develop, fund, and implement a local hiring plan which will include extensive outreach events and training opportunities. All jobs will be prevailing wage. This will consist of a mix of both union and non-union trades. Our local hiring goal will be 20% of the roughly 1,000 construction jobs. In addition, we expect that one-third of the 32 BGA union property maintenance jobs will be filled by members of the East Harlem community. Finally, our local WMBE contracting goal will be 20%. As, our, as a final component of our employment initiative, we are exploring opportunities to arrange internships with the many high school students that will be involved in this project. Certainly coordinating with co-op tech students as they seek to transition into good paying construction jobs is a very natural fit as we expect to organize 30 internships with Avalon Bay, our construction manager still to be selected, and with our subcontractors throughout this process. In addition, we expect there will be opportunities to match high school students with local employers, including Metropolitan Hospital on 97th Street and others within East Harlem for non-construction roles. In summary, in the last slide, this project offers significant public benefits, the construction of a new, bigger, and better equipped school facility for co-op tech, creation of a modern new school to house Heritage High School and Park East High School, 300 plus units of permanent affordable housing, the reconstruction and revitalization of Marx Brothers Playground, 30 plus internships for co-op tech students with a developer and our contractors, quality job creation, again paying prevailing wages, approximately 20,000 square feet of neighborhood serving retail. We allow for the expansion of the cultural resources in East Harlem at the Julio de Burgos Latino Cultural Center, and the project is funded by ECF and the developer with no city capital funding. At this point, I'd like to introduce Kevin McCarthy, of Park East High School who will speak to uh, his school's needs. Good morning. Good morning. Just introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Kevin McCarthy, and I'm the principal of Park East High School in East Harlem. I'm here on behalf of uh, myself, the principals from uh, the Heritage School and Co-op Tech, and our students and the families that we serve uh, to implore you to approve this opportunity for our kids. Our schools work very hard to serve our students and their families under uh, far than ideal circumstances. Uh, in each of our buildings, we deal with conditions that limit our abilities to provide the kinds of learning experiences that our students deserve. 
Park East and Heritage are in converted spaces that were never designed to support instruction adequately. There is no outdoor space at all. Uh, we have no dedicated instructional spaces for physical education or art. We teach those classes in the cafeteria. Tiny half-sized classrooms that are designed to support 12 students are used to teach 25. At Co-op Tech, they struggle to meet the growing need for specialized instructional spaces to support their unique career and technical education classes and give our students a real world skill set and level the playing field. These are but a few of the examples of the constraints that we live with every day in our current inadequate buildings. Our kids deserve better. They deserve the same opportunities afforded to kids in other parts of the city, including the ability to be outdoors. Our kids are your kids. Don't you all want the best for your kids? I know there are people that oppose this project for various reasons, but those reasons against don't come close to the reasons for this project. As one of our students said at a community board meeting, this gives us hope and opportunity. Only through this project do we get this opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about this crucial issue. I implore you again to please approve this opportunity for our kids. Does that complete the testimony of the panel? Okay. Let me just mention for the record that we have been joined by Council Member Dan Gorodnik and Council Member Andy King. And we will begin with some questions from our speaker, Melissa Mark Viverita. Thank you, Council Member Gentile. So um, thank you for the testimony. I, I know that um, the review process has already gone before the community board, has gone before the borough president. We're here now. Uh, there's been a lot, a lot of conversations with all of you, Avalon, ECF. Uh, we, as obviously have heard from the community and those of us that are representatives of the community, have been bringing a lot of the concerns to the table. So I, I appreciate the level of engagement and um, that, that we've been having on these matters to take into account concerns that have been raised by the community and to the principal, thank you so much um, for being here. Uh, I've been advocating very strongly for both Park East and for Heritage because of the substandard space they have. Brought the chancellor to both schools to really understand the limitations that they have. Uh, this has been an ongoing issue and challenge and something that the community is really concerned about, that we do provide the best educational opportunities to our children, particularly in schools that are performing well. Uh, and so this is really a moment in time which is important. So um, I know that the Chancellor has on her own separately also paid particular attention to some of the needs that both these schools have had. You've mentioned some of the questions I have in your testimony, but I do want to just reinforce it in terms of, of, of your response. Um, just to clarify, and I know this is something that I mentioned when we voted on the resolution or the home rule for the park alienation, um, there is absolutely no space that is being lost in the park, correct? Right? Correct. It's being correct. replaced 100% in terms of the amount of open space available will be the same as it is now. 100%. Right. Um, it actually includes also that piece that has been um, taken over by the MTA's Second Avenue staging as well. So the entirety of the, the park playground will be reconstituted and remodernized. Okay, so I, and then I want you to just explain again about the, the relationship, the JOP, and, mm -hmm. and in terms of community access to that playground and versus school access to that playground, just in terms of, of uh, detailing that a little bit further. Correct. So, and I have um, some members of parks, the Parks Department here that can speak with much more technical ease than I can about um, the parks. Uh, the JOP functions during the day, the school hours in support of the schools. So the JOP from 8 to 4 p.m. are utilized by the schools, and then after hours they're, they're open to the public, um, permitted through the Parks Department, um, during the day, during the week, I believe on the weekends as well, they're permitted through the Parks Department. Um, so any time that the schools are not in session, 
it's open space for the community, and then there's specific permitting that goes through the Parks Department. Are those the same requirements that exist right now? Yes. So it would be just following and mimicking? Uh -huh. it, would, it would maintain its JOP status and go right back to the permitting and the use of the schools. So it would, it would return to use between 8 and 4 by the schools, and after school hours, it would be maintained by the Parks Department. Okay. In terms of the, this was mentioned, in terms of the phasing of the project, mm -hmm. I think it was indicated, sir, I think the second test, uh, the person who testified, uh, that the co-op tech, the school would be built first? Correct. Um, Just the, talk about the, the phasing. The, the ECF mandate is that co-op tech has to stay operational until their new building is built. So all the schools are actually operational until the new schools are built. So Co-op Tech will be built first on 91st Street, I'm sorry, on 97th Street and 2nd Avenue. Once that building is completed, the current Co-op Tech is demolished and then the two new school buildings will be built. So there's no loss in instructional time for any of the schools. So all the schools get built first? Correct. Okay. And at what point is the playground? Is the playground being structured at this time, restructured at this so. time? I believe so, correct? Yeah, just one clarification. Yeah. The, on the, uh, while we're building the first building, the co-op tech building, the, the residential build, building will be built at roughly the same time. It's the same foundation. You have to build it together. But the school clearly will be finished before the residential building, and then we would build the second school building where the existing co-op tech building currently stands. Okay. What's the, uh, if this is approved, what is the timeline for the full project? Uh, the, the, the full pro uh, project timeline is to open the Co-op Tech School um, in 2021 to 2022, which is basically two to three years after we start. Um, and then we would start the second high schools at that point after the Co-op Tech is vacated and a similar two to two and a half year construction period for the second schools. And then, you know, while all that's going on, the housing will be built simultaneously. Okay, so open co-op tech, the new facility, the new school building, 2021. Correct. Okay. And the uh, second two schools? 2023. By the end of 2023. 2023. Okay, so then, and again, I know you alluded to this in your testimony, but I just want to, because it is a question that I have and a question I'll keep asking. So in terms of looking at the tower, um, and looking at whether or not the design or the, the way you envision where the tower is going to be, if that could be adjusted, the idea of having residential floor plates above the school as a way of uh, minimizing the height, if you could speak to that. Sure. So just to repeat, um, in, under the current plan, we actually have a, two school floors of the Co-op Tech building under, our, under the residential tower to start. Uh, you might be referencing some other studies that were done uh, by some third parties as well as uh, ourselves that showed residential tower on top of the second school building, but the um, meaning along First Avenue. Uh, but the long and short of that is that it simply doesn't work. Not obviously, because uh, it's on the other side of the it, uh, right. It doesn't, and, and it doesn't work uh, in particular because it doesn't meet the goals of the school and the, the programming uh, goals. Um, in order to do that, we'd have to expand the footprint, which means the parkland or the, um, the playground would actually be uh, minimized. So you'd have to take space away from the playground in order to make the footprint bigger for that type of arrangement with having residential on top of the second school building. What is the height of the, the second school building with a heritage and Park East Star? What's the height of that structure? That's eight stories. And was any of the scenarios of moving the park over towards First Avenue to accommodate the other buildings, maybe building over the school facility, a park mm -hmm. east and heritage? One of, one of the requirements, um, and this, this actual diagram speaks to it extremely well, one of the requirements as we worked with the city agencies is the Parks Department specifically requested that the playground be moved mid-block so that it, the schools bracketed the, 
the, the actual playground itself. So that's led to the playground being mid-block. Um, the city planning agency requested that the residential tower be located on the corner of 96th and 2nd Avenue um, to take advantage of the two wide uh, avenues and streets. So that left the configuration to be constructed as it is right now. And those, again, I'm just getting yep. information and we can move mm -hmm. And let me ask additional questions after. Um, looking at the, the schools themselves, obviously one of the issues is the prior, you know, prioritizing East Harlem students. Correct. If you could speak to that. So we've continually had conversations with DOE. I know that they're looking at addressing what kind of priority that they could guarantee for East Harlem students. I know that that's a conversation mm -hmm. that um, the chancellor has had. Um, and I know with some certainty that they should be able to release the information about what they plan to do for that priority within the next two weeks. They're looking at it right now. They've assured me that within the next two weeks they'll have something. Okay. And then you spoke about the local hiring strategy of incorporating local stakeholders. You mentioned names. So I, I know that that's a conversation that's really critically important. Correct. And it, and it continues every day, every week. Because I know we, I hear, I hear higher NYC, and that always gives me a little bit of pause. Know, the focus I... is not necessarily very community focused; it's yes. more citywide, yes. just employment focused. So our issue is advocating to make sure that our community benefits from those opportunities. Yes, and we've heard the same thing, and I think that's one of the reasons that we've wanted to work with community stakeholders, um, the ones that have been mentioned here, but continue to find opportunities to work with community stakeholders um, and community organizations that really involve the community on a sort of ground floor level. So I think that's a, we, we welcome any, uh, any other suggestions. We continue to try to find other groups. These, these three or four that we've talked about obviously are the ones that are, are most um, dominant in that area, but I think even smaller workforce opportunities is something that we're looking at. I don't know if John. Do no, but just also on the affordable housing side, we're also having conversations with local stakeholders about who could help us not only with the outreach and the marketing and the administration of the affordable housing programs, whether it's El Barrios Operation Fight Back or Hope Community uh, or others, um, but as well uh, providing credit counseling so that people can be prepared, well prepared for the documentation required to qualify for this affordable housing. Um, yeah, and doing that obviously sooner rather than yes, later, right? Because yes. these opportunities are important. And, and look, uh, you know, we, this is opening the, the review process for us as a council, so we're, I'm hoping to engage my constituents to hear more feedback. Mm -hmm. The height, I know, is an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the affordability levels uh, are, you know, are in some cases continue to be an issue for me. Um, obviously, the level of community benefits and what the community would get in return, mm -hmm. uh, not taking into account uh, some of the ancillary benefits, like freeing up, you know, taking heritage out of La Julia, you know, Julia de Burgos mm -hmm. Cultural Center, really frees up that cultural mm -hmm. center to be what it was envisioned to be. And then that right now is being stunted uh, because the school, which is a, a space that just isn't not suitable for a high school, um, is, is it there? So there's other uh, ancillary, but there's obviously real serious concerns. The last thing I want to just ask, and I know they might, they might, some of my colleagues may have some additional questions. You've indicated several times in the testimony, and we know that there is no capital allocation from the city. Um, you indicated that, you know, HPD, this is not a project that will be eligible for HPD subsidies. But how was any scenario looked at where if there were to be some sort of capital investment from the city, mm -hmm. uh, in what ways that would alter the project, whether it be going to, to deeper levels of affordability, whether it is, you know, bringing down this, the scale and height of the building, uh, if there were to be a commitment of capital dollars from the city of New York, in what ways would that change the composition of this project? To take into concern some of the, uh, to take into account some of the ad additional concerns that are being raised by the community. Yeah, um, I, I, the short answer is that we would consider it. Uh, we'd have to know what what those subsidies are and, and uh, the level of them and how they come about. Um, we'd be happy to work with the staff uh, to consider those. But as of right now, without knowing that any exist. There were no exact studies done. Right, I think I think that's something that we should discuss further. So those those are some of my questions. Obviously, if there's any additional questions from my colleagues, and then uh, we'll hear from the public. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And we'll go now to questions from Councilmember Richie Torres. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I 
take it that the cross subsidy from the 700 market rate units is funding both the affordable housing and the educational facilities, is that? Correct. And obviously the opportunities for these long overdue capital investments in the educational facilities sound exciting, but if I heard you correctly, th there's no room for compromise around height. You feel like you cannot go lower without jeopardizing the cross subsidy, is that? That's correct. Okay. What, what's the value of the capital investment in the educational facilities? The educational facilities, the construction cost for the educational facilities, yeah. is, it's uh, approximately $300 million, and that's being paid. ECF floats bonds for the construction of the schools, and those bonds are repaid through the rent and tax equivalency paid by the developer for the, for the project. And for the affordability units, what, 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 what affordability levels are you reaching? Uh, it's in uh, eight, page 18 of the deck that I think we distributed. Um, it's 40 percent AMI, uh, at, you know, the 10 uh, percent of the 30 percent that are affordable would be at 40 percent AMI, uh, 15 percent would be at uh, 16 percent AMI, and 5 percent would be at 110 percent of AMI. The lowest is 40? The lowest is 40. Because th these are the MI, these are consistent with the MIH program, mandatory inclusionary housing program affordability levels, but uh, the difference between this program and what might become uh, come before you at, in other applications is we're going above and beyond in terms of the number of units that would be produced, so this is more affordable housing, but at those requirements. But given that these are luxury market rate units, is 30 percent feasible? It would be required. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. 30 percent AMI? Oh, no, no. Oh, it's 30 percent AMI. It is not feasible, no. Okay. Because of? Because of the benefits that are um, uh, that are being paid for out of the uh, the program, we have the schools, the public sp open space, and the affordable housing, um, and we need to maintain the, the viability of the project. And what about the nature of the construction? Is it union, non-union? It'll be all prevailing wage. Uh, it'll be a mix of union and non-union. Uh, uh, we expect. And what about the building maintenance? Uh, the, the building maintenance uh, is going to be 32 BJ union. 32 BJ. Okay. Is this project exempt from MIH? No, it is. It is under being. It is being. It's subject to the requirements MIH. of MIH. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's the extent of my questioning. Thank you. Okay. Uh, seeing no other questions, we will dismiss this panel. Thank you very much uh, for being with, with us. We're going to pause uh, in the hearing proceedings uh, to, since we do have a quorum. Do we have a quorum? Councilmember Reynoso, you coming back? Yes, we do have a quorum. Okay. We've been joined by uh, Councilmembers Antonio Reynoso and Councilmember Rafael Salamanca. So we're going to take a, a, a brief pause in the hearing to uh, vote on several applications that were laid over from our previous meeting. Uh, we will be voting on, we will be voting to approve LU 682 and 683, the Whitlock and 165th Street rezoning in Councilmember Salamanca's district. This application is for a, re <coughs> excuse me, for a rezoning and text amendment to facilitate an affordable housing development and Councilmember Salamanca supports the approval and I understand that Councilman Salamanca does have a statement to make. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. Um, um, uh, today I am pleased to support 1125 Whitlock Avenue, which will bring over 470 units to my community in the Bronx. Since first hearing about this project, I've been excited, notably because it will replace what currently is a blight block of rundown garages and other light industrial businesses and buildings. So needless to say, new development is welcome here. However, I have worked diligently with our team here at the Council, HPD, and the development team uh, to make this project one that works for our community with our specific needs in mind. As a result, I was able to successfully negotiate with all involved, and today I'm happy to say that this project is one that will be built for the people of the South Bronx. As always, I fought for a wide mix of affordability, including nearly 150 units at 40% AMI or less, including large units. Uh, with new HPD term sheets requiring a 10% set aside for the formerly homeless, we ensured that these units were of larger sizes to provide for formerly homeless families, particularly with children. I was very adamant, and as a result, we were in conversations until late last night on ensuring a great
and on ensuring as great of a commitment as possible regarding local hiring and WMBE outreach. And as a result, we have set a goal of at least 30% for subcontractors and laborers to force the community involvement. We were also able to uh, attain a commitment on permanent jobs, ensuring good paying jobs with benefits once the building is completed. With Whitlock being a semi-major thoroughfare in the area, we ensured that the developer was committed to conducting a traffic study to help minimize traffic issues during construction. And once the project is completed, we have ensured that there will be adequate safety and surveillance, publicly accessible open space, a new community mural, lighting, and sanitation. Mr. Chair, with the approval of this project, I'm proud to say that since taking office, I have helped to shape or approve nearly 4,000 units of affordable housing for our community in the South Bronx, and I look forward to continuing that progress in months to come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Salamanca. We will also be voting to approve LU-684, the Lower Manhattan Plaza Applicability Text Amendment. This application would, cha uh, would change the applicability of the Plaza Bonus Rules in section 91-24 of the zoning resolution. This change would allow development sites in C6-4 districts within 50 feet of a designated retail street to take advantage of the public plaza bonus provisions. Council Member Chin supports the approval and she did submit a statement that I will read into the record. After con uh, careful consideration and review, I write today to give my support for application number 170286-ZRM, a text amendment intended to clarify section 91-24A to allow a plaza bonus in appropriate locations in the special lower Manhattan district. The application will facilitate a new plaza in my district, bringing more than 5,000 square feet of publicly accessible space in an increasingly residential financial district. The community board approved the application with conditions and in furtherance of these uh, conditions, the applicant has committed the following in writing to my office. One, a briefing, a briefing the community board in my office on the plaza design prior to certification by the chair of the city planning commission. Two, that the new building owners will regularly and permanently maintain the plaza. And three, that the plaza will incorporate additional programming beyond what is required by the zoning resolution provided that this does not disturb neighborhood residents. This includes the potential for interactive art and other family-friendly features. The application was also approved by the borough president and the city planning commission. The applicant still must return to the community board on July 18th and schedule a briefing with my office. Giving these commitments, I recommend that my colleagues vote in support of this application and it's signed sincerely, Margaret S. Chin, council member, district one, New York City Council. We will also be voting to approve LU-689, the sec uh, uh, section 93-122 of the text amendment. This application would change the zoning regulations applying to a development site in sub-area 3 of the special Hudson Yards District. The, the change would allow for a building containing residences to be developed prior to the minimum amount of commercial floor area being developed for a zoning lot of at least 55,000 square feet, but less than 69,000 square feet. A portion of the zoning lot would be reserved for the mandated commercial space. And Council Member Corey Johnson, who's in whose district it is, supports this approval. Lastly, we will be voting to approve LU-690, the Bedford Arms Tax Exemption. This application would provide a tax exemption for the for 1350 Bedford development that was approved at our last meeting. And Council Member Cumbo, whose district it's in, supports this approval. Do we have any questions from the members of the subcommittee on these applications? Seeing none, I will now call for a vote on LU 682, 683, 684, 689, and 690. Council, please call the roll. Council Member Gentile. I vote aye and all. Council Member Gorodnik. Aye. Council Member Reynoso. I vote aye. Council Member Torres. By a vote of the four in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions, the land use items are approved and refer referred to the full land use committee. Okay, thank you. And now we'll continue with our hearing. Okay, and this is on LU 700 through 703. Our next panel will be uh, Mike Bradley from 32BJ and Chris Widello, I believe, from AARP. So he, Widello may actually be for Baychester, but 
we didn't know, so you may not come. Oh, okay. Somebody say in for me. Okay, you may begin. Just in, introduce yourself before you speak. Yes, good morning, uh, council member, members of the committee. My name is Ron Wade. I'm a resident of East Harlem and a local 32BJ. I'm here representing on behalf of 70,000 building service workers represented by 32BJ in New York City, including over 1,200 members who live in East, East Harlem and over 700 members who work in the neighborhoods. 32BJ members clean, maintain, and provide concierge and security services in schools, offices, and residential buildings throughout the city, including at projects like the proposed development at East 96th Street. We are here today because this is an important project that will bring much needed benefits to the community. Among those benefits are good jobs for local residents. The East 96th Street project will generate approximately 40 permanent building service jobs in a residential portion alone. These jobs will provide family sustainable wages and benefits to residents of East Harlem rec recruited throughout the local hiring program. Avalon Bay made a firm commitment that these will be good jobs that meet area standards. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, let me, let's just clarify here. Gentlemen, what is your, your name, sir? Ron Wade. Okay. Are you on this project? Seven? Yes. You are? Okay. Yes. I don't think so. the other gentleman was. Right. Yeah, he's on the he's gonna come back. Okay. That's the Baychester project. Come back on that one. All right? Okay. We just want to clarify. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Good question. Okay. Thank you. Next time. Yeah. Okay. Our next panel on on uh, LU 700 to 703 will be Caroline Harris from Carnegie Hill Neighbors, Diego Barberini, Barberi, I'm not sure how it's spelled, but Diego, um, George James, Jeffrey Croft, I believe, um, and Lowe Vanderbach. Oh, Lowe Vanderbach from Carnegie Hill Neighbors. Good morning, um, Carol. Well, hold on one minute, let's, let's get set up first. Everybody in place? Okay. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Caroline Harris, a partner at Goldman Harris. I represent Carnegie Hill Neighbors, uh, and we're opposing uh, this application. Uh, I am a zoning attorney, and so my focus is on the zoning issues here. Um, uh, we believe the com subcommittee, uh, of this subcommittee of all subcommittees, should not allow the proposed circumvention of a zoning resolution, even for a project proposed by the speaker with its literally and figuratively lofty goals. Uh, whether or not the Marx Brothers Playground is in a zoning district or is a mapped park, uh, it's clear that it's under the jurisdiction, at least in part, of the Department of Parks. Pursuant to Section 1210 of the zoning resolution, it is the boundary of a block, the boundary of a zoning lot, but may not be part of a zoning lot. Hence, it has no development rights or floor area. Um, uh, the uh, ECF clearly has, must agree with that because if it weren't a public park, uh, ECF would not have to seek its alienation from the state legislature in order to imbue it with floor area that would then be conveyed to Avalon Bay. Yet 
uh, state authorization for the uh, disposition of the park, the alienation of the park is being sought. So it's clearly a public park. It's clearly not, does not have floor area now, but it will be temporarily conveyed to ECF in order to suddenly magically give it floor area. This is audacious. It's unheard of. When the park is then reconveyed to the city without floor area, it will again be the boundary of a zoning lot, and Avalon Bay's building would become non-compliant. DOB should not be allowed to approve that subdivision under the zoning resolution, so the whole legal construct for this project is deeply flawed, fundamentally breaches the zoning resolution in at least two ways. These are terrible precedents for all public parks and all jointly operated playgrounds. Being a jointly operated playground means it's under the jurisdiction of the Parks Department. The key issue here is that the program, though very important, and I don't mean to minimize the importance of having new modern educational facilities, it's just too large. ECF should rethink the goals. At no time have the goals of this project been rethought. It started as a project with one school, instantly, very soon became a project with three schools, and since that time there has been no thought to reassessing the goals of three schools. Reducing the number of schools and the amount of floor area needed to, to support them uh, would be a, uh, an appropriate investigation that has not been done. This subcommittee should not approve the project without a serious reconsideration of the goals of the project. And a more creative solution of meeting East Harlem's obviously important need to build new educational facilities and to serve the Burgos Latina Cultural Center. Thank you. Hello. Hello? Okay. Yeah. My name is Diego Barberena. I don't represent anybody but myself and my two kids. I live in 85th Street and 2nd Avenue. My first son was born in 2007. At that time, the playground Max Brothers was demolished for the construction of 2nd Avenue subway. I was told and promised that once the construction of the subway is completed, I will have my playground back. Uh, I was hoping that this would be 2012 when my kid was still like five, now he's 10, and now we're not getting the playground, we're getting this building. This building is gonna take like six years to build. There's a soccer field that is now open, but is mainly used by older people, which makes a kid uh, dangerous to be there because they're playing with, with a soccer and ball. Uh, I've been asking and asking where's the park coming, when is the park coming, as the subway was completed, and it never happened. Until one day, I see in Google that Avalon Bay in, uh, in the webpage says that they have this development and they're marketing as the Upper East Side. So <clears throat> this makes me look more into it and look into the zoning and see where the fraud is. Now the definition of fraud according to the dictionary is the act of deceiving and misrepresenting. City planning was presented with a manipulated zoning map as current, and the community board 11 was presented with a version of that also. This is not the current zoning map. It was a manipulated zoning map. You've been told everything that is good in the project, but not everything that is bad. And a park has no FAR to give, so <clears throat> basically what they're creating is a 20 FAR development. The park is gonna be in the middle of two developments, creating shadows all the time in the park. The only reason why the park is in the middle is to permit the light and ventilation for the buildings that are constructed. It's in reality a side yard or a rear yard. I have nothing more to say, and I please will consider that you ask the questions, see the fraudulent thing, and stop this process. And if they want to start it again, they can start it again. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Croft. I'm president of uh, New York City Park Advocates. Um, we ask that the city council deny the zoning changes being sought for this irresponsible project as currently proposed. The proposed legislation would allow the development of Marx Brothers Playground, a city-owned park that occupies half of, of the block between 1st and 2nd Ave Avenues and 96 and 97th Street. 
We strongly believe that the approval of this project raises significant legal and public policy issues. This action would temporarily assign zoning rights for the public playground to ECF, then transfer the newly generated development rights derived from the alienated park land to Avalon Bay, a private market rate and affordable developer for the construction of his massive 1.1 million square foot, 760 foot uh, above curb level tall building. After the alienation, uh, after the uh, parkland is alienated, after it's developed, the land between the buildings would then be legally uh, returned for use as a public park. This would establish a terrible pre precedent. The alienation of a public park in order to generate development rights is a circumvention of the zoning resolutions uh, regulations that preclude public parks from having development rights. The city has hundreds, as what has been um, already represented here, the city has hundreds of jointly operated playgrounds, public play spaces the Parks Department shares with the Department of Education. This action would not only open up all existing JOP properties for non-park commercial purposes, but the floodgates would also be opened for potential commercial development on all public parkland if this is uh, uh, approved. It is not a secret that the Educational Construction Fund would love to use parklands for these pur purposes. If passed, there is nothing to prevent other city agencies from also attempting to develop our pu public parks for commercial purposes, no matter how well-intentioned the projects purport to be. Simply put, alienating parkland in, in order to create zoning is a bad precedent and will have far-reaching implications and so a misuse of the public trust do doctrine. The alienation of these, this playground is not being done for park pur purposes. To the best of our knowledge, the city has never before exercised its power to alienate an active public park for the direct benefit of a private market rate residential building or the indirect benefit of providing security for bond issuance for construction of schools. If approved, Avalon Bay will also uh, be a reference for all future developers seeking a special permit for or a zoning change. This will be able, this, they will be able to prove that the city not only accepts, but encourages changing or creating a new zoning context with at least one building um, that is 700 feet, feet high. For more than 60 years, children of all ages have enjoyed the unfettered access to sunlight as a result of a corner location of this playground and adjacent open field. This proposed plan will destroy that. ECF is asking the city to permit the relocation of Marx Brothers play, Playground 100 feet to the east on the same block to make room for the residential tower on 2nd Avenue. After this is completed, if approved, the, the community will get their park back in uh, basically five years. The, t the tower, as this gentleman has testified, will block much of the sun from the playground for this heavily utilized park uh, and feel for most of the afternoon throughout the year, degrading the park and the pu public's use. Alternative approaches must be considered. The desperate need for schools and affordable housing are two of the most pressing issues facing New York City. This issue is especially acute in East Harlem. However, one city block should not have to shoulder that e enormous burden. As you are aware, one school was originally proposed on the 96th Street side. This is now increased to three schools to accommodate 900 students in deference to the city council speaker. This massive tower would be egregiously out of scale for the neighborhood and cause negative environmental in impacts. As one city planning com commissioner com commented at the May hearing, you can't even see the top of the building from the rendering that the city and the developer provided, and that remains true today. We have not seen from the floor uh, perspective of, of that. Simply put, th this is midtown zoning in East Harlem and York Yorkville. Thank you, and, and just as I wanna go on the record, uh, and ECF's um, repeated assertions that this is not parkland um, is legally extremely que questionable. My name is uh, Lowe Vanderpalk. I'm president of Carnegie Hill Neighbors, uh, a community uh, organization that uh, is, wor works for the betterment of our community. It's in the Upper East Side. It, uh, it 
it is close to the site, but it does not touch the site. Our catchment area stops at uh, Third Avenue and um, and uh, 90, 98th Street. Um, we are we are opposed to this project, um, not because of its laudable goals, which they are, uh, but because it it violates not just zoning, but it creates a very tall building. And I I have this handout that you have. Um, the the uh, it shows you the view from from the Triborough Bridge that this this tower is the most visible. Um, Structure in the Upper East Side from that vantage point, it's it's twice as tall as any of the neighboring buildings, and it is the tallest building north on the east side, north of of 60th Street. And um, as you also look on the view on 96th Street, it is it is it towers way above any other building on 96th Street. Most of those buildings are zoned R10, limited to 210 feet, and the one block that's not limited has a highest building being 400 feet. The Normandy Towers are not, e not even 400 feet. So this, is, this building is only possible because, because this is a large project. You're going through ULERP where you are changing the zoning the zoning for this block is limited in height to 210 feet. You are creating and giving permission to create a tower that is three times what would normally be permitted. I, I, we understand that this is a special project. It deserves a taller building. We could, under, we could live with something in the range of 450. But the, the height that you are seeking is, is too much. And uh, while you have very many goals, ver very many laudable goals, which includes affordable housing, it includes the two high schools, it includes the vocational school, and the restoration of the playground. At the same time, the project is being hemmed in because n nothing, nothing can, can be moved because there's the claim that you can't put residential on top of the two high schools at First Avenue because if you do, the, the foundation needs to be strengthened and the costs are, are, are exorbitant. Also, the claim is you can't even fit the program without entering the play air, playground by some 22 feet, which is, which is prohibited. So every place you move, you try to make a change that could work. It's impossible the way the project is defined. And I think that really leads to the fact that this project is overburdened with goals. And, and probably if you eliminated one high school, I, I would hate to say that, uh, you could solve that problem. There may be other ways, but I think that there should be a willingness to discuss this and to look at alternatives in a deeper way than has been done so far. Um, That, that, is the, that is the basic complaint that we have, and, and I, th I would hope that there would be a period of reconsideration because the train is moving very fast. This is the final panel. And it's worth, it's, worth, it's worth trying to solve the problem in a way that can be copied elsewhere, but not in a way that stands out as a very sorry project in terms of zoning and the livable neighborhoods. Remember, this is a residential area while the building is a midtown tower. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, George Jaynes. Hi, my name is George Jaynes. Um, I'm a planner. Uh, I, I work often with Community Board 11 and Carnegie Hill neighbors, uh, but here I am testifying on my own behalf. Um, I think everyone agrees that uh, new schools and affordable housing are great, especially a new trade school. It's a fantastic, um, fantastic project. The problem, and really the only problem with this, and you've already heard many people say it, is that parks are not zoned, 
they don't generate fluoria. I'm not going to repeat that other than just saying that that is, that is the problem with this project. Um, after, the, after the park is given back to the city, the resultant development, meaning the tower on 2nd Avenue, is going to be 26 FAR. Okay, what does that mean? 26 is a number. The Empire State Building is 30 FAR. 432 Park Avenue, the building we all see on the skyline that has changed New York City's skyline, is 14 FAR. This building will be 26 FAR after the park is given back to the city. If we say that the parks don't generate floor area, and parks have never generated floor area, they have never been used as development sites. This is other than, other than when they're vacated and then given back. Right, when they don't generate floor area. Um, and in this case, it's generating floor area to build this building. It could not be this large without parks generating floor area. Now, you may say, this is just 96th Street, it's one project, you know, we're gonna make an exception, but you know, there's about 300 jointly operated playgrounds in New York City. So the consequence of this decision of saying that jointly operated playgrounds aren't really parks, they generate floor area, goes way beyond 96th Street. And right now, on Park Avenue, um, Eugene McCabe Playfield, it's part of the Park Avenue rezoning. The community has asked repeatedly to carve it out. Don't include the playfield in the Park Avenue rezoning, yet it's still there, R10. City wants to rezone the playfield, R10, so that, of course, because it's a jointly operated playground and generates floor area. You know, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago what I thought the next frontier of New York City residential housing was, I would have said NYCHA projects, NYCHA estates, because there's an enormous amount of unrealized floor area there. I would have never, ever said that parkland was the next frontier for um, new, new development projects, I would, it, because there's too many protections for it. And so when this project came out, I was kind of astounded by it, and I was actually shocked but ultimately, after realizing what's going on, this is about how New York City is going to treat its parkland in the future. So I urge you to vote no against this. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, thank you. Do you have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Are there any more members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on LU 700 through 703. Our next hearing will be for LU 694 through 699, the Baychester Square development. This is an application for a disposition of property zoning map amendment, a zoning text amendment, and three special permits for property located at the intersection of East Gun Hill Roads and Edson Avenue. These approvals would facilitate the development of a large retail complex containing approximately 376,000 square feet in seven buildings and a 13-story, 180-unit senior housing development. The zoning map amendment would establish a C4-3 district instead of the existing M1-1 district. The disposition approval would permit the disposition of the property by DCAS to the developer, Gun Hill Square, LLC. The text amendment would establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area on the property and permit physical culture establishments on the site. The three special permits would allow for the waiver of various zoning bulk signage and parking regulations. This application is located in Councilmember King's District in the Bronx. I will now open the public hearing for LU 694 through 699. And I will introduce the speakers. Yeah. So the next panel will consist of Lydia Downing from the Economic Development Corporation, Charles Gaines from the New York City Economic Development Corporation, Robert Marino from New York City Transit, MTA, uh, Charlie Samboy, New York City Economic Development Corporation, Sarah Tranter from Baychester Square. Is this for the second panel? Should we, um, 
I'm going to raise that up from right here. No, you're not. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. You may proceed. Uh, good morning, Councilmember Torres, Councilmember King, and the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. My name is Sarah Tranter, Senior Vice President at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. I'm join, joined by my colleagues and the developer and MTA here today, um, all of whom will be available to answer questions following our testimony. I would like to start by thanking members of the Subcommittee for providing us the opportunity to present the Baychester Square Redevelopment Project and appreciate your consideration for approval. At EDC, it is our mission to create shared prosperity across New York City's five boroughs by strengthening neighborhoods and growing good jobs. The proposed Baychester Square project exemplifies this approach and achieves many of the core principles of our mission by providing necessary funds for the MTA's transit infrastructure investments in excess of $30 million, creating 180 units of deeply affordable senior housing at or below 60% of AMI without city subsidy, offering new retail options in a borough that has demonstrated strong, consistent, and growing demand, and generating hundreds of new jobs in the Northeast Bronx with its participation in the city's higher NYC program. In an effort to reduce operating costs associated with the MTA's real estate holdings and generate critical funds for the MTA's capital needs, EDC and the MTA jointly issued an open RFP for the acquisition and redevelopment of this 12.6 acre site, which is currently vacant and underutilized. The RFP's development goals included maximizing revenue for the MTA transit infrastructure investments, activating the site, and ensuring a financially and physically feasible project. As an aside, I'd like to note that the Baychester project follows the same model as the redevelopment of 707 East to 11th Street, a former MTA substation which is in the same council district. EDC and the MTA collaborated on the disposition of East to 11th Street, and the site was subsequently remediated and rehabilitated to facilitate the expansion of a local small business and to create opportunities for local employment, as well as to offer new retail, community facility, and housing options in the neighborhood. The East to 11th Street project generated nearly half a million dollars in revenue to the MTA in support of their capital needs, while simultaneously removing blight and having a positive impact on the surrounding community. Back to this application, in response to the RFP, EDC and MTA evaluated nearly one dozen proposals, and following a competitive RFP process based on criteria outlined in the RFP, EDC and MTA ultimately executed a contract with Gun Hill Square LLC, a joint venture between Grid Properties and Gotham Organization. Not only did their team meet all of the aforementioned goals, but they also have tremendous experience developing a number of critically acclaimed retail projects, including Harlem USA and DC USA, and have demonstrated a track record of working with the steadfast support of local residents and business leaders. Elected officials in the public sector, they've exceeded construction and permanent local hiring goals, and for this project have partnered with McQuiston a WBE certified senior housing developer with many successful completed projects in the Bronx. Drew Greenwald, principal of Grid Properties, will provide an in-depth review of the proposed project. But in short, it will transform and reactivate the vacant site into a pedestrian-oriented open-air urban shopping complex by introducing new retail options and bringing tax dollars back into the city, creating 180 units of new senior affordable housing, offering access to a new business resource lab, providing free parking, and creating 2.5 acres of publicly accessible outdoor open space. The 180 units of senior housing proposed for this site will be deeply affordable, with 25% of the units affordable to senior households earning 60% of AMI, 25% at 50% of AMI, and 50% at units of 40% of AMI. Additionally, the rezoning of this site will trigger mandatory inclusionary housing, calling for 30% of these units to be permanently affordable. As we all know, the city of New York is in a housing affordability crisis, and more specifically, households on fixed incomes feel this burden the greatest. Recognizing this need, the administration allocated $1.9 billion this past budget cycle towards creating 5,000 additional units specifically for seniors in the coming years. It is our hope that this project helps to advance a matter of public policy of great importance to us. 
I would also like to call to attention that Bronx Community Board 12 and its adjoining districts 10 and 11 all have senior populations above the borough average of 11.4 to 12.2 percent in CB12, 18.3 percent in CB10, and 13.3 percent in CB11. In a report published by Live On New York in 2016 titled Through the Roof Waiting List for Senior Housing, they found that 110,000 senior households citywide are on a waiting list, on average seven years long, with Council District 12 having the second largest waiting list in the borough, with 2,170 seniors awaiting an apartment. According to their metrics, given a low response rate to their survey, they believe that the wait list is actually more likely double at 4,300 seniors. This informative report and a growing senior population in this area only accentuates how much more important it is for us to deliver deeply affordable senior housing on this site at this moment in time. Finally, in addition to redeveloping a property that has been vacant for the better part of the century, we cannot stress enough the fact that this project also provides much needed funds to the MTA, with every dollar of the $30.5 million purchase price allocated towards MTA's capital plan. We are all very aware of the needs of the subway and transit system in New York City. And we are excited that this project not only provides a great benefit to the community, but also helps the MTA in its efforts to maintain our transit system. In conclusion, we ask the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises to approve this application to help support our shared goals of strengthening neighborhoods, growing jobs, and providing affordable senior housing, all of which will contribute to the Northeast Bronx's continued vitality and vibrancy. Thank you for your time and consideration. We look forward to answering any questions you may have following the testimony. I will now turn it over to Robert Marino from the MTA to discuss their role in this project. Good, after, good, after, good morning, Council Members. I am Robert Marino. I'm Acting Vice President of Government and Community Relations at MTA New York City Transit. And I have a letter I'd like to read into the record from our Acting President, Daryl Eirich, in support of the project. Um, the letter is to the committee, Subcommittee Chair Donovan Richards, which I will leave uh, after we speak. I write in favor of the Baychester Square Uniform Land Re Re Use Review Procedure, ULERP number CZ10218ZMX, submitted by the Department of Citywide Services, Citywide Administrative Services, pursuant to sections 197C of the New York City Charter for the disposition of one city owned property located on Block 4804, part of Lot 100, borough of the Bronx Community Board 12, Council District 12. The proposed Baychester Square project would approximately 350 square feet of rentable commercial space, 180 units of affordable senior housing, and a 40,000 square foot fitness center, 2.4 acres of open walkable space, a 4,000 square foot business resource center with a media lab, and approximately 1,160 parking spaces is, the, is before the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises today. The project site is owned by the City of New York and leased to New York City Transit under a master lease. It is a former golf driving range adjacent to New York City Transit's Gun Hill Bus <clears throat> Depot facility in the Bronx that closed its doors for business at the height of the 2010 financial recession. The project is a result of a long-term collaboration between the City and the Metropolitan Transportation Authority and the culmination of, the, of efforts by the public sector to invest in the all-important transportation infrastructure system. As you, well, as you know well, the MTA provides essential mass transit services to the city and New York metropolitan region. MTA operates, maintains, and invests in the transportation system, without which the city and the region cannot function and compete economically and effectively with other major cities around the globe. However, coming up with the necessary funding for the MTA's capital investments and improvements has always been an ongoing challenge. Seven years ago in 2010, having repeatedly, repeatedly encouraged by elected officials who asked that the MTA seeks to maximize the value of its surplus properties, MTA began a collaboration with the city through the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services and the New York City Environmental Development, uh, I'm sorry, Economic Development Corporation and the New York City Department of City Planning to evaluate MTA's entire portfolio of real estate assets owned by the city but operated by the MTA the master lease properties to determine which properties would be available to help fund the MTA's capital investment program. After an extensive search, only seven properties were identified as, as surplus and made available for sale through New York City EDC. Out of the seven properties, only two were expected to be of high value. 
Baychester Square is one such high value property given its 12 acre size, its location on East Gun Hill Road close to the I-95 and Hutchison River Parkway, and its proximity to the Bay Plaza Shopping Center on the other side of the interstate. Five years ago, in March of 2012, New York City EDC released the RFP soliciting for submission of proposals for the Baychester Square site. The RFP generated a, re a robust, robust response and balanced between MTA goals and city goals as follows. The MTA's goals of disposition are to reduce costs associated, associated with and derive maximum financial value from the property with the sale proceeds to be contributed by the city to the MTA's capital program and the city's goals are to restore the property to the city's tax rolls, reactivate underutilized property by fostering redevelopment, generate construction and permanent jobs, and otherwise further the city's economic development objectives. MTA worked closely with New York City EDC to ensure that the RFP process complied with and adhered to the requirements of the city's disposition rules and land use regulations and the selection criteria of the RFP. Gun Hill Square LLC, the sponsor of Baychester Square project, was selected because it proposed, it, its proposal furthers the goals and objectives and met the criteria as set forth in the New York City EDC RFP, which will contribute positively to the city, the MTA, and to the Baychester community of the Bronx. The Baychester Square site will return the underutilized property back to the city's tax rolls and result in productivity, productive economic use with a private investment of over $300 million. The project will force the redevelopment and revitalize an important section of the Bronx, generate approximately 830 construction jobs and approximately 1,200 permanent jobs, and otherwise further the city's economic development objectives and goals. The local community will have 180 units of new affordable senior housing, creation of permanent jobs, business assistance and job training, job placement programs from the Business Resource Center and Media Lab and the MTA will benefit financially from the sale of the property, $30.5 $30 million to continue its vitally important transportation investments for the future of all New Yorkers. An example of the use of funds <coughs> is, the transit, is the transit improvements the MTA is currently undertaking, such as the $226.2 million signal upgrade at the Dyer Avenue station in the current 20 to 10, 2014 capital program, and the $42 million ADA elevator project at the Gun Hill Road Dyer Avenue Five Line Station in the 2015 to 2019 capital program in the Bronx, among countless other critically essential, essential improvements throughout the transit system in the city. After a seven long years germination, the project, currently the project is at the City Council Review stop of Europe. It, for whatever reason, if for whatever reason, the project cannot be rezoned for the intended mixed use from its current manufacturing zone, the MTA will have no choice but to revert, revert the project site back to New York City transit usage in keeping with the original reason for the acquisition of the project site by the city on the MTA's behalf in the late 1980s. Therefore, the MTA encourages the City Council to approve the Baychester Square application since it was at the urging of elected officials long ago that the MTA started on the path of disposition of underutilized or surplus master lease properties to assist in the funding of this capital plan. Thank you. Good morning, uh, members of the Council, um, the general public. I'm Drew Greenwald, uh, one of the principals of Grid Properties. Uh, Grid Properties and the Gotham Organization, as Sarah mentioned, are the uh, primary developers behind the overall project, and the McQuesten companies uh, are the experts doing the, uh, the senior affordable housing. I want to talk a little bit about um, our background so um, people can, uh, can get comfort with the uh, things that we say, um, that we do the things that we say. Um, on the screen is a project called Harlem USA the planning for which began in 1992. Uh, the building was finished in 2000, so it's been up 17 years. Um, we still own the project. We actually moved our offices, our corporate offices, into the project 15 years ago. Um, we've been very committed um, to the community from the beginning. We worked very closely. It was an eight-year process till construction uh, was completed. Um, and you can imagine that we had many hearings. Uh, People had many different ideas that got incorporated into the project. There were ideas that didn't. But in the end of the day, um, everybody is happy with what was done there. And we invite you, know, you to visit the project, to um, talk to community organizations that were involved in the project. 
Um, it was a great collaboration. We repeated a similar type of thing in Washington, D.C., in a project called D.C. USA. Um, and basically, um, we try to do something that um, we think is both economically viable for the developer, but delivers on the various goals that the community has. And so in the case of Harlem, USA, uh, we worked very closely uh, with several community organizations, primarily Harlem Commonwealth Council. Um, and to, to, they identified, for example, uh, they work closely to identify um, the types of retailers that uh, the community desired. They work very closely uh, for programs of, of job training and job readiness, worked closely with retailers to identify potential employees for the project. Um, there were so many things that were done collaboratively um, throughout the process and that um, it continues. You know, what you, what you think is the way you want to do it in the beginning changes as you go through the process. Um, and as you own the building, there are additional things that, you know, tenancies change and others come in. Uh, but throughout the whole thing, we, we and the community organizations that have worked with us have encouraged retailers to be very active in the community, whether they're supporting things like the, the Harlem Little League or other causes or arts organizations. Um, you know, whether events have been done that, that work with community organizations. Uh, we set aside space in the project, 5,000, uh, I'm sorry, about 8,000 square feet for five years. That was something called the Hip Hop Culture Center, uh, which Curtis Sherrod, who is here, um, can, can speak about it. Um, we've enlisted him to get involved in one aspect of this project called the, uh, the Business Resource Lab, which we'll get into in a minute. The idea there was that almost 100,000 school-aged children were put through this hip hop culture center with various programs that had kind of music as its backdrop to you know provide them with various exposure and skills and things like that. Um, we we and the Harlem Commonwealth Council said we want to have it's very important to have a bookstore on 125th Street and none of the you know national retailers wanted to come, so we went and scouted around the country to see if there were minority-owned bookstores that would want to come to Harlem, USA. We found a store in Denver, Colorado, of all places, and convinced the proprietor to open at the, at the project and gave them basically what amounted to zero rent for 10 years um, to have this store. So, the, you know, it's really a collaboration, and we really encourage you, whether it's Harlem or D.C., to, to, to research and find out that, you know, we have been a very good and, and lasting community partner and it's very important in a project like this because there has to be this trust that develops between the community and the development team that they're going to do what they say. And one of the reasons we brought in uh, the McQuesten Group to do the, um, the companies to do the, the senior housing is their record of success in the Bronx. And Charlene will speak to that in a little bit. I'll ask her to come up, talk about her, her being on the opposite side of McQuesten as a community resident, and then ultimately coming, going to work for McQuesten because she really liked what the company stood for. Talk a little bit about the site. Almost everyone here, I assume, knows the site, um, recognize a lot of the faces. It used to be the old golf driving range. If you, uh, if you drove up or down I-95 across from Co-op City, um, you would, you would see the um, driving range. Here, here is the site using the cursor. Across from the site, the Bay Plaza Mall and Shopping Center, Home Depot, the Aldi Shopping Center, uh, right over here next to Home Depot. What's, what's interesting characteristically of this site is that it's basically surrounded by roads and other retail. That it really is a great destination for retail because of the, of the road network. And it's why there's a lot of retail there now. The retail there is very successful. And it also... Um, the, the, the site that's here is kind of the tooth that's missing. When you look at sites like this around the country with this kind of density, you see more retail than is currently at this particular uh, destination. Other, other interesting features about the site, the site has, was mostly fill and is actually, um, you've got to go down to most parts of the site, 150 to 170 feet to find suitable bearing material uh, to put a building on. So what that means is it's very hard to do anything more than about a two-story building. But what is very interesting that we found out in the process of 
um, looking at how we could put affordable housing into the mix when, when the idea first you know, came out of community discussions. The corner of the site <laughs> that is right over here actually has rock at 25 feet below the surface. So that location is extremely conducive to a building of more than, say, the two stories. The other problem on this site is that the water is very high, and early ideas of trying to somehow place parking below grade um, didn't work because the water table is too high. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the planning process. From the very beginning, um, when we first looked at this RFP, we, we had been looking at retail opportunities in this part of the Bronx because all studies had shown that uh, almost two billion dollars of retail sales is lost to Lower Westchester, which means that residents, you know, choose to spend the dollars elsewhere um, because in some cases the opportunities are not as complete as they want in their, in their local area. And so the, while you have a complete offering uh, or uh, if stores in the mall, of a, a big box in Home Depot, what's missing in what people leave, go to Westchester for is what they call a lifestyle center, lifestyle environment, where people get out of their cars and they walk around, they, 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 have, they dine, they do a lot of things beyond just jumping in and out of their car and buying something. And so those projects like Ridge Hill and Yonkers and Cross County um, attract people from the Northeast Bronx because such an opportunity doesn't exist. Now, if we, I go back to what I said before, if you look at other projects around the country, you tend to have a regional mall, you tend to have lifestyle across from it, you have your big box. This has sort of got that tooth that's missing. And our idea here, when we realized what the, that there was unmet demand, we responded to the RFP and looked to create really a sense of place around which, you know, you, you have this sort of mini urban village. Here's the site plan, which, um, as you can see, our idea was a bunch of, of, of mini blocks around outdoor open space with the parking ringing around the outside, placing the senior housing, as I mentioned, along Gun Hill where the su subsurface conditions are ideal for it, placing some other retail here to draw people in. And what's interesting to note here is that the on this site, the, the housing represents a third of the floor area of the site. The retail represents two-thirds. When you look at the plan, it looks like there's more retail because the retail is only two levels and the, and the housing is 14 levels. So in this plan, you have one-third, you have two-thirds. What's also interesting is the amount of open space that's walkable and landscaped, and it doesn't include any of this open space that's parking. The actual amount of usable open space by people is 2.4 acres, okay? That represents about half of the amount of area that's actually covered by building. So it's, a, it's an interesting, um, you know, ratio, which is a lot greater than, than you know, most, um, most mo you see in most projects. Also want to point out here that because you, the project's set up in a way that when you come off of I-95, you can go right in the project, you can come off of 95 this way and go in, so we took advantage of the, of the road networks to not create circulating traffic within the neighborhood and within the project. The parking is set up in such a way that wherever you park, it's an easy walk to the rest of the project because we want to encourage you to go in and out of all these public spaces. There's, you know, fountains at either end here. To give you an idea of scale, this space is 100 by 100. It's 10,000 square feet. That's um, bigger than this room. So it, there's a lot of, of different public spaces within the, within the project. And of course, you know, lining here will be, you know, outdoor cafes and things like that as, as people, you know, make their way through the project. The project itself benefits from having two signalized intersections that exist to get in. It has a, um, another a entry from Edson. It has four ways out. It has ample queuing within the project. It has a very efficient ring road that distributes you throughout the project. Again, the idea is to bring pedestrian-focused shopping together with healthy dining, fitness, and education and healthcare uses. I'm going to get into this a little later, but this process started and it was only retail. 
And then we had our first meetings with community representatives and senior housing, and then the senior housing grew. And then we had meetings with, you know, Council Member King, with uh, Borough President, with others, and different ideas started to work their way into the project. So if you see here in this rendering, this level, for example, above the retail, this is where you would have educational, fitness, or, you know, healthcare type uses above the retail to meet some of the needs that have been articulated in the back and forth that we've had in, um, in meetings and discussions with the community. Of course, the big, big um, piece of the project, one third, as I mentioned, is the senior affordable apartments. This is a view of the entry park in front along the corner of Gun Hill and the entry to the project. The project's actually framed by the entry of the, ho the housing and, and some small retail on the other side. Um, the thing that was very important to us is that McQuesten, and that's one of the reasons we went with them, is we, we work with really strong architects because our project's quality matters. We've won awards for almost all the projects, and we wanted the same from the affordable housing. And Gluck Plus, um, which if anyone's familiar with the new tennis center and educational facility in Cretona, that's designed by Gluck Plus. Um, McQuesten's using them for this project, and as you can see, this doesn't look like your typical every floor is the same senior housing project. They're very much into their affordable housing looking like market rate um, type of projects. Very, this is that, um, the corner here where, I'm, where the rendering shows you this, how much outdoor space there is associated with the senior housing. There's an entire back area of outdoor open space. And in additionally, there is a bunch of communal spaces on the grade levels for all the senior residents. There's easy access to parking for the senior residents at the bottom of a, an indoor parking facility as part of the project. The other thing is they can walk, for, you know, on these sidewalks, really don't, not crossing an intersection to get from the project to walk around and enjoy the project. So, for senior residents, the ability to have the project and its open space immediately adjacent to them is, we think, a great amenity. The other um, types of amenities that, um, that McQuesten has put in, for example, there is at the stepped roof areas that you saw in the other pictures, there's outdoor terrace areas that have laundry rooms that are on the outdoor terraces. So this is a you know, very high quality approach. And what's really important is 100% of the units are affordable. Um, MIH is uh, uh, being applicable here because of the rezoning, which means that 30 percent are, are affordable forever, but, but 100 percent are affordable. And as you can see, um, it's pretty deep affordability at 50 percent, at 40 percent of AMI, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, just another view of the, of the retail and of, our, of the design approach to the project is um, the transparency of all facades that wherever you are in the project you're looking at you're looking at storefronts. Um, project will have free indoor and outdoor parking and free bicycle parking. This is a view of the senior housing next to the indoor parking facility and one of the retail buildings along um, Gun Hill. Very important um, goal that was stated in the beginning of the project was you know environmental sustainability um, it was a goal stated by community residents who are concerned about health issues in the Bronx, also by EDC. And so, you know, we'll be going for LEED Silver certification. What this is, is actually a green wall with water and other features that is between the garage and the outdoor senior space that I, that I had shown you on the site plan. Just another view along Gun Hill Road, the facing Gun Hill of the retail, the quality of the architecture, very important. Something we learned in Harlem is that to make the project um, desirable to as many retail tenants as possible, the quality of the building has to be as good as anything else there is anywhere else in the city. And uh, as mentioned before, it's been approved by the community board, the borough president, and city planning commission. Also, the project is supported by the um, retail mall immediately across from our project. And I bring that up not to just tout the, the support, but um, they own about 1,000 malls or something like that around the country. 
And they subscribe to the same notion we do, which we've seen in Harlem and in Washington, and that's that when you have a critical mass of retail and you add to it, the area only becomes more desirable, that it is actually better for all the merchants, it's better for the mall and the landlords, um, and that's not something that necessarily that thought that comes naturally to everybody, but I do want to bring it up here because I think that existing merchants will do much better once you fill out the type of choices that the resident has. And as, as um, Robert said and Sarah said, these are some of the benefits that are coming, um, economic benefits that come from the project. The other thing is those retail dollars that are leaving, the city is capturing those dollars back, which basically instead of the jobs and the sales tax going elsewhere, they're, they're coming back locally. Feature that I um, started to talk about was the, uh, was the business resource lab. When Councilman King asked us, is there a possibility of there being kind of a higher paying executive jobs here, an office park or anything like that, and we looked at the high vacancy rate of office space, for example, at the Bay Plaza Mall, we looked at the fact there's no mass transit here, we looked at the size of the site, we said that's really not necessarily feasible, but we understand the need to kind of um, add to the um, earning power of local residents so that a business resource center, and I'd like to, um, if I can, can I call up Curtis to briefly talk about it? Sure. This is Curtis Sherrod, who I mentioned before, had headed the Hip Hop Culture Center in our project at Harlem USA, and he would be involved in the creation of this business resource lab. So for you, Curtis, for two minutes. One, two. One, two. Got to see if the mic's on. Mic check. All right. Good afternoon, how's everyone doing today? So the Business Resource Lab will actually be a resource to the community. Um, as far as people who work- Sarah, I apologize. School, Do you mind just identifying yourself and your association with the- uh... Sure. My name is Curtis Sherrod. Okay. I am working with Grid Properties. Okay. My role will be to take care of the, be the executive director of the Business Resource Lab. Okay, and what's your current position, Curtis? Currently, I am president and CEO of All Things Traffic. We are an employment agency. We've been staffing uh, and training and consulting for the past, uh, since 2000. My roles have been at companies such as Pfizer, where I've placed over 300 people and have been the person who ran their marketing, their editorial, as well as their uh, copy and proofreading departments for 12 years. I've placed over, I've placed thousands of people and I've trained people in order to get employment. Previously, I worked at the Hip Hop Culture Center, and I still do, where we use hip hop to bring young people in, and once we get them, we teach economic literacy, political awareness, diet and nutrition. You can give us any subject matter and we will regurgitate it in a hip-hop-centric way to reinforce what's being taught in the classroom. Thank you, Curtis. I just wanted to reflect for the record who you were. That's all. Thank okay, you. Okay, cool. Well, yes. any questions you have for me, I'm quite happy to, uh, to answer for you. And so at the Business Resource Center, we're looking to be, as I mentioned earlier, a resource to the community. We want to be able, if you are an employee in one of the stores and you want to upgrade yourself, you want to learn a new skill set, if you have hopes of uh, being an entrepreneur, we want to give you all the tools and resources that you need to take that route. We want to put in there a lot of activities that will be stimulating, whereas right now there is a digital divide. For example, there's not a job you can get unless you are computer savvy and uh, digital uh, qualified. Even if you're a senior, if you want to get an assessor ride, it's so much easier to go online. Everything they steer you is online, but how do you maybe get training to learn how to do some of these things? We will have a radio facility there, whereas if people in the community, we will teach you how to be an on-air personality, we will teach you how to be an engineer and how to use the equipment, and then you can do broadcasting from there. We will have a green screen studio, so we will be broadcasting TV shows from there. We will take advantage of all the things that used to be cost prohibitive, but because of technology has made affordable and has made easier to accomplish. We will have a 3D printing uh, press there so that we could teach young people how to take advantage of some of the things that they may not have access to now. So we want to be a hub 
right there at Baychester Square. Whereas if you're a senior, you can come there. If you can't get your grandson to help you uh, get your TV set hooked up or get your laptop hooked up, you can come to the center. We'll have someone take care of that for you. If you need someone to hook up your resume or teach you how to take a project from conception to endpoint in a timely and cost-effective manner, we will do that for you. And so I'm excited about the project because I've been doing work similar to this for years. I've been working with uh, grid properties for a decade now, and I look forward to putting our stamp at Baychester Square in the Bronx. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Um, I'm going to try to finish this up pretty quickly now. Um, zoning actions. Um, I want to just point out that the site is um, an M zone right now. It's being um, rezoned to, you know, to a C43 zone. But the, there's going to be a restrictive deck, or there is, um, that basically is limiting the FAR to what there is now. The reason for this change in the zoning is not, was not to give the developer uh, extra floor area to build some big building, as you heard in the previous hearing. Um, the purpose was to allow the senior affordable housing, because residential is not permitted in the M zone, and to allow more flexibility in the retail mix, because every retail use group is not permitted in an M zone. Um, so that was the real purpose of that as part of the zoning process. A uh, very, very detailed uh, environmental impact statement, traffic studies were done um, to, to basically identify uh, the mitigation member, me meth, um, measures that will have to be um, implemented um, during the process. And I also should point out that uh, once the project is up, DOT and our, our uh, traffic consultants study what the impact actually is to make any adjustments if needed because as people have probably heard before the DOT criteria are um, you know very um, conservative and um, it may turn out to be that uh, certain mitigation measures aren't needed at all it's usually doubtful that more things are needed because of the conservative nature of the analysis um, I want to just um, conclude by, by going back and reiterating in, in a, the number of things that have been added to this project since the beginning, because I think it's important for people to understand that it started out there was no housing. Now it's a third of the total area of the project. The um, open space has greatly increased to, this, to the 2.4 acres. Um, Baychester Square, there had been some concerns mentioned over time by different people. It's not going to be an outlet center. It is deed restricted by the contract with um, EDC. So that is something that there had been a concern about. The number of retail tenants has actually been reduced over time in discussions with uh, Council Member King and others. 40,000 square feet of space, as I mentioned before, is going to actually be devoted to uh, medical, um, educational, or fitness uses. Um, and there will be some mechanism in the contract that you know, requires a certain period of time. And, effort and whatever it is to, to, to fulfill that. Um, there will be smaller spaces for things like urgent care and specialty fitness uses. Um, there will be uh, we, what we call a taste of the Bronx where local food merchants are, you know, put together in a food hall that sort of has authentic um, Bronx food as opposed to kind of a whole bunch of national, you know, food tenants. So, um, you know, these are all things that have happened as a result of, of interaction with the community and with elected officials. And these are things that we hope will continue to happen. People have been responding to the project's website and listing all these retailers that they want to see here that aren't here. Um, people have been, you know, putting down their names for information on the, you know, the senior affordable housing. We'll be working with the community board on all of those types of things. They'll be involved with the housing lottery with McQuesten. Um, they'll be involved in identifying prospective applicants for, for job opportunities. You know, in, in, in Harlem, we exceeded all of the MBE, WBE, local hiring. Uh, I think 90 percent of the employees now are local in the permanent basis. So for the construction period, we'll be, we'll be doing the same thing with the community. It's a process that is, you know, while it started five years ago, it's not even halfway there. And this process will go on. and. Uh, you know, we hope that you'll all be comfortable, you know, working with our team. And we encourage you to talk to people that have worked with us before because they'll tell you that we always, you know, live up to what we say. Um, thank you. And I've got a whole team for questions if you have them.
Thank you. Is uh, Charlie Gantz testifying from uh, EDC? I'm available. I'm available for questions, but I'm not providing any testimony. Okay. Thank you very much. So, does that end the panel's testimony? Yes. Okay. Great. Why don't I? Uh, why don't I start off? Uh, I see a representative here from the uh, MTA. Yes. You uh, identify yourself for the record. Is it Robert? Yes, Councilman. How are you? Can you just identify yourself for the record? Sure. It's Robert so. Marino, Acting Vice President of Government and Community Relations at New York City Transit. Thank you, Bob. Let me ask you this question. So there's been some speculation about alternative uses for this uh, property. Has that been contemplated at all in terms of what kind of alternative uses, uh, if, for example, this wasn't successful, what alternative uses you might be looking at for this particular parcel? I uh, actually just read a letter into the record, and in that letter, um, I can tell you what it says. Um, let me just find the paper. Give me the short version. Sure. Bob. If, if, Thank usually you. what we do is when we have a, uh, a, a extra piece of parcel or a vacant land, we will look at our other agencies to see if there is a use for it. We will look internally to see if there's a use for that for that land before before we would go forward with any other type of public project. Okay, so you don't have any current possible. No, but we would look for another. Uh, uh, what I just said was we would you know we we would look at all our serve our agencies and look for another transit use. Got it. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Council. So. Once again, just to be clear, there's no other current alternatives on the table for this particular parcel. You would look for other possibilities, but you don't have them right now. We would look for other possibilities. If for some reason this ULARP didn't go through, we, we would go and look. We would look at other possibilities. Got it. Fair enough. Okay. Um, a question for uh, the developer. You mentioned that there was going to be um, mandatory inclusionary housing on this site. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, but most, but most of the site is, in fact, uh, commercial. Is that correct? Uh, in the rezoning, yes. Okay, so therefore, once again, I just want for folks who are either in the audience or who are at home to understand. So essentially, uh, the mandatory inclusionary housing wouldn't apply to the commercial piece. It would just apply to the residential piece. Is that Cor correct? Uh, correct. Okay, so in total, how many, uh, how many residential units uh, are you going to be building that there's you're committed to having as affordable? There's 180 units, and it's 100% affordable. All okay. And how much uh, square feet does that take up in total of the project? Uh, it's one-third of the total um, FAR of the project is taken up by the housing and two-thirds by the retail. And the total is about 540000 somewhere around there. Okay, so FAR. it's around one-third housing, two-thirds retail. The rest is open space, just to be clear. Is that essentially? Open space and your parking. Yeah. Open Which space and parking. parking, outdoor parking. We don't count the outdoor parking as open space as, as we describe it, even though somebody would say it's open space. From a zoning perspective, parking is open space, but when I talk about 2.4 acres, it's only the walkable, usable open space in our presentation. No, once again, uh, it's not okay. a criticism. I'm just trying to, you know, once again, I, this is very complicated for folks who are either have taken out from their day, and there's a lot of people who came here today, and I want to thank them all for coming out, and we appreciate that. But for the folks that are here, <laughs> thank you, yes, yes. We ask, if you don't mind, we know you're very enthusiastic, but here in the council, we wave just for decorum purposes. So if you're excited, you can just wave. Thank you very much. So. Just for the purposes of the people that came out, I just want them to understand the proposal. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's not a criticism, yeah, it's just understand. an understanding. So essentially, of the space that you're actually building, right, which is the what we'll call the buildable uh, space in terms of the structural space as mm -hmm. opposed to the open space and mm -hmm. to the parking, one-third of that is going to be affordable housing, and two-thirds of that is going to be essentially commercial, commercial retail, retail, commercial retail yes. space. Yes. Okay. Do you know what kind of tenants that you're planning on having uh, in there? Do you have any tenants already signed up or anything in contemplation of what kinds of folks you expect to uh, be utilizing this space? Are we talking like big box or smaller stores? Like what sort of no, the I sense? I think we, we see a, um, an eclectic mix of stores from smaller to medium-sized stores. We there. Anything in particular? Do you have sort of like a sense of, oh, we have a, we'll have an anchor store over here, or we're expecting a big box or a smaller store? I'm just trying to get, once again, no, I, no, I said the purpose, I just want to be clear, the purpose of the questions is really just to inform the public and the public who's here and the viewing public at home just to get a better sense of what the project is actually going to look like. So yeah, uh, what well, do you think the project's going to look like in terms of the kind of stores? How many stores do you anticipate having? What kind of stores do you think okay. you're going to have? They can be larger stalls, smaller stores. Just give us a little bit of a sense of what it is that you're looking to do over here. Okay. The, um, 
the retail, and I had the site plan up there before, has basically, um, you know, eight different elements that contain retail. The ground level is mostly much smaller stores, um, local, national, but small stores, combinations of restaurants and boutiques and things like that. On the second floor will be slightly larger stores because we have floor plates up to 30,000 feet on the second floor, so you could have a tenant that occupies you know, 30,000, you could have a tenant that occupies two tenants that occupy 15,000 square feet. Um, we think it'll be an eclectic mix of all of the types of tenants that are not currently in the marketplace. And if you were to make a list of the tenants not in the marketplace, you get into the hundreds. So uh, there's a broad uh, range of tenants out there uh, to serve the needs across a whole bunch of categories uh, for residents of the community. And how many stores in total do you think there'll be? Probably somewhere between 40 and 50 stores is my guess. 40 and 50 stores? Yeah. Okay. Which would mean that an average... So like a mix? Can you tell me like 20% is going to be food or... You know, I would think that we're going to have yeah. food about in somewhere in the 30,000 um, range, somewhere between 10 and 12, maybe 15% of the tenancies will be uh, what, what I would call healthy dining. Okay. I don't, by the way, I think we can, every, everybody has a different definition of healthy dining. Well, I'll tell you, the definition is not a lot of fast food. I think that there are a lot of concepts out there today, and we've got them in other projects, where uh, there's a consciousness for, um, you know, natural, organic, um, healthy, fresh, whatever you, however you want to call it. It's not the... So you won't have any fast Not your food. mother's McDonald's. You won't have any fast food stores. You won't have any Burger Kings, McDonald's, anything like that. Un unlikely, and anything that you would call fast food wouldn't be um, your McDonald's, Burger King type of store. So, for example, there are now um, tenants who are 100% organic that make salads that you would probably maybe call fast food because you don't sit down, but you take them out. So, you know, the, the categories and descriptions have been shifting a lot in retail. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we're uh, done with your panel. And uh, you. we're going to ask the uh, next uh, panel, if you don't mind, we'll have some of you stick around just to listen to the questions and the comments. I think that would be helpful as well. Thank you very much. All righty, good afternoon. I'm going to start with uh, the next panel, Richard Bass, Bay Plaza Mall, Gerald Safian, Bay Plaza Mall and Shopping Center, Robert Clayson, Bay Plaza Shopping Center. And each one of you will have two minutes. There will be two minutes on the clock for each person testifying. I want to thank my esteemed colleagues for uh, holding the fort down. Fortunately, the mayor, uh, fortunately, the mayor was in the district this morning, so I was a little delayed uh, in getting here. All righty. Uh, once you are ready, you would just state your name for the record, uh, and then you may begin. And I am uh, just reminding you uh, there are two minutes. We are putting two minutes on the clock. Good morning. All right, you may begin. Good afternoon, as the case may be. It, I'm Richard Bass, Senior Planning and Development Consultant with Ackerman LLP. I re represent the ownership of Bay Plaza Mall and Shopping Center. And I'm speaking on their behalf in opposition to the land use item before you. 
These actions would facilitate the project known as Baychester Square at the MTA site at 1769-1771 East Gun Hill Road. This site is located three, just 300 feet from Bay Plaza, directly across I-95. In 40 years of practice, I have rarely opposed a, a proposed development, but we are concerned that Bay, uh, Chester Square will uh, harm Bay Plaza, which has struggled to survive and grow over the last three decades. The owners of Bay Plaza substantially invested in the Northeast Bronx at a time when no one else would, starting with the construction of the Bay Plaza Shopping Center in 1988. Just three years ago, in 2014, they completed construction of the mall at Bay Plaza, the first ground-up indoor mall built in New York City in over 40 years. The mall attracted tenants that have never before located in the Bronx, H&M, Michael Kors, to name just a few, and added 2,000 more jobs and nearly 800,000 square feet of retail to the area. Currently, Bay Plaza is a source of over 5,000 jobs, generates over 63 million annual real estate and, and sales tax, and provides a valuable community resource. Despite its hard-earned success, Bay Plaza is still 12% uh, vacant, uh, approximately 200,000 square feet, which is approximately half the size of the po proposed retail development on the east side, uh, uh, on the west side of 95. As you probably know, brick and mortar retail stores are struggling nationwide, and this has been widely reported in newspapers and business publications. It is clear that the Bay Chester Square project can only succeed at the expense of Bay Plaza, particularly if it is marketed as or contains outlets. Uh, given this, we would, have, we would have opposed any retail use at the MTA site, but we, can I indulge you for one more minute? I just sure. have very specific suggestions. We're not looking to restrict competition, but we would like the committee to focus on the following require that language be inserted in EDC's contract with the developer that mandates a restricted declaration against the site containing the following restrictions to be included on any CFO, that no outlet store shall be permitted, that no retail uses at the site shall be marketed or advertised as outlets, and that all leases including uh, such prohibitions require that proposed signage on the site comply with existing height and size regulations and prohibit the use of word outlet in all signage and require that the permitted floor area at the site be restricted to one FAR, the same as our, our mall. We understand that one of the goals of the proposed project is to generate needed revenue for the MTA, which is a valid policy consideration. It is, however, bad public policy to allow development at an unfair advantage that will harm existing businesses, eliminate existing jobs, and result in lower sales and real estate tax revenues. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Sir, you may begin. Yes, uh, good, af <laughs> yes, good afternoon. Uh, uh, it should be lit up red. You know that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Chairperson Richards, my name is Gerard Sofian. I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of New York. And, uh, rep and also an adjunct professor at NYU Tandon School of Engineering. I've been engaged by the ownership of the Bay Plaza Mall and Shopping Center to serve as an independent reviewer of the information contained in the EIS for Bay Chester Square. I'm here today to offer comments that I believe warrant careful consideration before the subcommittee. Based on my review of data provided to me by the Plaza Shopping Center and Sam Schwartz Engineering, it is evident to me that the critical impacts of the project have been substantially underestimated. The effect of this shortcoming would be the likely adverse consequences on existing retail facilities in the project study area. Correctly defining the primary trade area for the project is a critical step in determining from where sales originate and the potential retail purchasing power of the area. The size of the trade area assumed in the IS is based on identifying the location of those shoppers who could drive up to 10 to 12 minutes to reach the project site. Unfortunately, the EIS assumed that greater travel distances could be achieved within the 10 to 12 minute period under current conditions of traffic congestion. A more reasonable primary trade area would be smaller and thus likely to exclude Mount Vernon, Pelham, and New Rochelle, and Westchester, and other outlying areas assumed in the EIS. 
A smaller primary trade area would affect the overall capture rate used to determine whether the primary trade area is currently saturated with retail uses and would more accurately disclose the extent to which any new retail facilities would challenge existing facilities and for customers. The business climate in the primary trade area for existing retail is more dire than portrayed in the EIS. Vacancy rate at the, at the Bay Plaza complex is actually 10% compared to the 4% used in the EIS. And uh, just want to mention, reiterate one of the problem, if I may, that the, uh, the competition in retail sales at, of, at traditional brick and mortar stores from the intense pressure exerted by fast growing e-commerce, online shopping has grown substantially, but unfortunately, the secret technical manual does not explicitly require consideration of this emerging disruptive force in retailing. The large primary trade area considered in the IES might have over-distributed vehicle trips. A geographically smaller area would concentrate project-generated traffic, which might result in increased traffic congestion at some locations beyond that identified in EAS. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Bob Clayson. I'm a real estate partner at uh, Ackerman. Uh, I have spent most of the last 40 years doing retail-oriented projects. I represented tenants like Toys R Us and Siemens Furniture and those in all of the deals they did for years. I do now do a much more substantial... Pull your mic just a little closer. Sure. To you. Thank you. Uh, I now spend much more of my time over the years doing outlet malls and the developer side of things. I've probably done four or five million dollars, four or five million square feet of, of, of retail on the developer side of which almost a couple of million have been outlet. My primary concern here, and I think the, the malls is that, whereas Bay Plaza is doing a good job in surviving, it is still highly vulnerable. And the type of traditional retail that is in Bay Plaza is unusual. You've got everything in there from traditional department stores to power centers to the more day-to-day -day shopper. And the most vulnerable to something like an outlet mall are the traditional department stores. The traditional department stores are the anchors of that center. And so if you damage the, the sales of those traditional department stores, you run the risk of their closing. And the thing that, that hits most of the department stores, the heaviest are outlet mall type of stores. There's no such thing as particularly an outlet mall center. There are outlet mall types of tenants that are all over the place. Uh, some of them call themselves outlets, some of them are manufacturer's outlets, some of them are where the manufacturer does it, some of them are just selling things off price. The real trick is how you market it. If the, if the center is marketed or has the name in it such as Baychester stores and outlets, you will immediately draw off the tenant, the, the customer from the traditional center into the outlet mall as it expects to get a better deal. The result is that you hurt the sales mostly of the traditional department stores and those are the ones that are at the risk. If they close, they take the center with it. This center has 5,000 jobs. It's a stable center. You introduce a different type of a market. You can't say, I'll not make it more than a third outlet mall. I can't make it more than 40%. It's how you market it. If you put it in the signage, if you advertise it that way, if you call it an outlet mall, it will have the impact that you don't want on the, on the region, on this center. Thank you for your testimony. And can you just speak? So you gave a few recommendations. Were those recommendations uh, submitted to EDC? Um, the city, they've been shared with EDC. They're shared with the, the committee. Um, currently, we understand uh, the applicant has made a proposal to restrict to 40% of the outlet, 40% uh, of the retail to outlets. Uh, the same type of language could restrict it to zero outlets. And you would prefer zero? We would prefer zero. Uh, you know, the old, old ex expression, if it you know, looks like a duck, cracks like a duck, it's a duck. So uh, if it's viewed as an outlet mall, uh, it will harm the activity that's been going on for 30 years across the street. Right. And can you, uh, what do you attribute, uh, attribute the vacancy rates to uh, in, your, in your mall? Uh, is it just the market right now or 
So just go through that a little bit. I, I can actually defer to the, the ownership if they want to speak to the, uh, uh, the vacancy rate. But as you know, uh, retail is, is struggling right now uh, with uh, competition with online. So the brick and mortar stores are having difficulty. So right now there's approximately 200,000 square feet vacant across the street. Now, is that, re is that retail space or office? Um, 50,000 is office, 150 is, is retail. Okay. And you would attribute the, vacancy, the vacancies to the market? To the marketplace and also just building up this area. Again, this mall has grown uh, organically mm -hmm. uh, over the last 30 years. The RFP was actually issued two years before uh, the, the interior mall was opened. Uh, I, I don't know if EDC was aware of that or took into account that. But again, there's only you know, so much you can slice the retail pie. Um, we're concerned about you know, having an outlet co com competition. Okay. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councilmember King for a statement on this item as well. And then uh, following him, I'll, I'll call this panel up uh, uh, before he begins. Maria McCormick, speak up for a better Bronx. Mildred Gove, Gov, speak up for a better Bronx. Leon Hall, Leon, Leon Hall, speak up for a better Bronx. Anita Marie Middleton, better Bronx and Jose Collin, or Cole, uh, Collin, speak up for a better Bronx. If you can all come up to the front, are you still here? If your name is called, what's called, you'll come up to the panel. So I'm gonna say it again, Maria McCormick, Mildred Gove, or Gav, Leon Hall, Anita Marie Middleton, and Jose Collin. Is that everyone? All right, let me get it. Okay. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, family, community, 12th District residents, Bronx community. First, I want to say thank you to everyone who came out today to share their concerns um, so we can hear your voices here at the Council on behalf of what is being proposed on the MTA site on East Gun Hill Road. I would like to also add to the record that for the last five years, I've heard your conversations with me, uh, whether it was walking down Gun Hill Road or going in the mall across the street from the site or in a grocery store or just some of the community meetings that we had in regards to how do we improve the 12th District. And one of the ways we wanted to improve the 12th District at this site was making sure whatever was developed on that site was a complement to what exists already in the neighborhood. I heard your concerns, I heard your voices, and yes, you know, the site has been vacant for over a decade now because the last developer didn't listen to the neighborhood and build a golf course that no one plays golf on. Well, that's not going to be the goal on this development. We want to make sure that our voices are heard. We want to make sure whatever we get to develop that makes sense for us, because why? We are the neighborhood who will be living there each and every day. We are the neighborhood who will have to deal with there if, if there's excessive traffic or just the busyness when you start building on 12 acres. So I say all of that because I wanted to be real clear on the record. For the past five years, I've engaged in conversations with the MTA, the developer, EDC, the mayor's office, to share your voices and let your voices be heard. As the same resident, I understand the plight that we are experiencing on the decisions that we have to make. So I wanted to be real clear that my goal, our goal, is to develop something that makes sense on this site. The proposed retail market, outlet, whatever you want to call it, that's being proposed. I've said in time and time again, I've been very consistent on how I would like for the final project to look like. 
at this date and day, I, I find it difficult to support an outlet mall knowing that we have the only indoor mall in the borough of the Bronx just released about 100 yards away. So we just want to talk about what we need. There's been conversations about senior housing. A question, I want to thank them for stepping up to the table to build senior housing on this site. And if we're able to be consistent and change up the projects, one thing, and if we can't, we're still counting on you, wherever this goes, that still be able to step forward and build senior housing on it. I've heard the MTAs cry about getting funding for this site. Well, whatever we got to do, we'll do whatever we got to do to get funding for you, MTA, but not at the expense of this neighborhood. So I'm asking us all to make sure that we sit down at the table as responsible adults and do what's in the best interest and not put price over people. That's the goal of this project, and that's where I stand. And I want to thank all of you who are in orange shirts, looking good in your orange shirts, and, and all of you who have came down, let them know that we're united as one community, and whatever we built on this site is going to have to make sense for our neighborhood as well as helping out the MTA. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember King. All right, we'll go to our first panel. You're going to have two minutes each, and I'll begin to my right, and uh, you may begin. First, I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone. I'm very happy that you're allowing us to speak up for a better Bronx. Um, I must your, say, I, your, let me correct you though, it's your house, so you have a right to speak. This is what thank you. the process calls for, so this is the people's house as we call it. So thank you. You're more than welcome. I've been living in the Northeast section of the Bronx since I was five years old, and I know that's now dating myself. Um, I remember when the streets weren't even paved. I remember when they were just dirt roads. So please understand me when I say to you, uh, I am all for positive development of the area. It's a beautiful area. However, the area is already saturated with commerce. We don't need another outlet, mall, store. It's just everywhere. Uh, the people who live in the area uh, are working people, and many of them are not here, but that's why we have over the 70,000 signatures, because people are concerned they want the integrity of this neighborhood to stay intact. It's a beautiful area. And all I'm saying is that it concerns me when outside developers come in telling us what we need or what we should have. Between the traffic, and the traffic is already horrendous when, the, when it comes to the holidays. So now you're asking for you know, more traffic, more noise uh, to this area that's already, I feel, is already being burdened with enough. I, I just want to make my comments brief. I give an example. This area is being built directly across from Michelangelo Junior High School, which was my high school. I'm very proud of that. Um, these kids don't need this type of uh, distraction. I remember there was a luncheonette across the street, and we used to mob in there. God help us when this mall comes. So I'm just saying the neighborhood doesn't need this. Between the traffic, the noise, it's going to be unsafe. You've got kids running across the street. It's just not needed. Uh, and they, when they say affordable housing, uh, that concerns me because I'm a working class person. So affordable housing to me is 30 to 70,000. Whose affordable housing is this being based on? That concerns me. And yet I've never met a senior that wants to live beside a noisy mall. That's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll go to the next panelist. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jose Colon. Um, I want everybody to take a nice look at that eagle up there and look at the ceiling. Mm -hmm. You know what it says up there? A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The people are here today to speak out against the price. I totally agree with the gentleman from Bay Plaza that were here. You got to go around that area and shop to understand what is happening. Also, uh, there was no mention uh, there's other malls around that area in Section 3, Section 4, Section 5. Just go around that area. More malls will create more problems and more pollution. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I got to sleep with a mask at night. You know, I also have two pumps. I got to take some pills before I go night for asthma. So enough is enough for traffic. And also, I do go to my church in that area. And sometimes on Sunday, it's traffic, traffic. 
So I yield my t rest of my time to this young lady next to me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mildred Gore. Myself and my family have been living in the Northeast Bronx since the early 70s. I've seen the changes. I've seen the traffic and the, the cars. It really is uh, too much. We don't need a mall. We don't need an additional mall. We have malls. We can travel to malls. Uh, what we need is affordable housing, and we need schools. And um, that's really all I have to say about it. Uh, a, a mall is not something we need at all, at all. Thank you for your testimony. Hi. I'm Marion McCormick from the Wakefield section of the Bronx. I am so tired of malls. This mall is unnecessary. We don't need another mall. My understanding, I think we have about five malls in the total Bronx alone. I mean, give us a break. We need housing. That's what we need, housing. That's all I have to say. Thank you. My name is Lion Hall. I live in Section 5. Yeah, you just press your mic. Make sure it's set Speak up. into the mic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Lion Hall. I live in Section 5. I am very happy about Bear Plaza. And to bring something else in there, in Gun, Gun Hill Road, would be a disaster. Because when you think of the children in the high school over there, it's a problem for them. And it's a bad problem for me because when, when the, on Friday evenings, I cannot get home. Bartow is blocked. And if they go and put something over by on Gun Hill Road, that's the way I try to get home. So if they put something on Gun Hill Road, I cannot get home. So I am not happy, I'm not pleased, and I don't think we should have another um, mall. Housing is good, or schools for the children is much, much better. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank we'll you. call the next panel, which is uh, Susan Lawhorn, Lawhorn, Speaker of Foy Better Bronx, Kathy Murray, Roxanne Delgado, Chris Wadello, AARP, and Sean Lashley, Speaker of Foy Better Bronx. I'm going to uh, maybe fill this panel with a few more people if everyone doesn't come up. Susan Lawhorn, Kathy Murray. Okay, they're coming. Okay, I see them. Roxanne Delgado. Chris is up there. And Sean Lashley. You're there. Okay. All right, sir, you may uh, begin. You can begin. Let's make sure your mic is lit up. Press it one more time, press the button. Hello. There you go. Beautiful. And you'll state your name uh, and who you're representing for the record, each person who speaks. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. How are you? My name is Sean Lashley. I'm speaking on behalf of Speaker for Better Bronx. Uh, we have been to every hearing where this matter has been brought to the public. And the question we really need to ask ourselves is, at what cost is the project being proposed at? I've listened to the presentation of the gentleman over there, great presenter, no problem. However, the cost as which, the cost as which you're looking to present the project is definitely too high. We're looking at healthcare, we're looking at traffic problems, we're looking at asthma problems. These are not problems we're willing to continue with. 
So based on all the current problems that's facing this project, flat out decline, let's find something that's gonna benefit the community much more and basically add value to a way of life in the people of the Bronx, okay? Everyone else around here will say a mouthful regarding the project and I'll give them a chance to say so. My thing is, no more retail, no more traffic. Much better air quality. That's it. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Murray. And what I have to say is very brief. If you see uh, the elderly with cans, they 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 picking up the cans and things in order to survive because they go to the um, uh, to have them uh, redeemed so that they'll have some money in order to survive. They do not have to go to a mall because they can't even afford a mall. They need something to eat. So they take up the cans and things. They're not, they don't need another mall. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. My name is Susan Lawhorn, and I'm just here to agree with everything concerning the mall business. We does not need another mall. It's true that the traffic is will be out of out, just just out of limits because with the asthma arising, we have the highest asthma in the Bronx as it is. So it was so one of the highest, and so with the traffic and all. This would make it even worse with the fumes of the cars and everything like that there. So what we do need is housing and school, what everyone said, which we agree on. But the traffic, no, no malls. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Okay. That's it. Hello. My name is Roxanne Delgado. I reside in Community Board 11th District, and I asked the City Council to disapprove the project because of insufficient public review and input. Neither Community Board 10 nor 11 held, held any public meetings or had any input in the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure, and both Community Board bordered the site of this project. This application for a new mall near the I-95, which is the top 10 congested roadway in the United States, impacts beyond the interstate. It will turn our residential streets into speedways for shortcuts around this already congested highway. The Bay Plaza already brought in a lot of noise and air pollution and lots of traffic in our local streets. Please disapprove this application because of insufficient public review and input. Both Community Board 10 and 11 that borders this site of this proposed project should be part of the discussion and part of the process. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Richards, uh, Councilman King. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify today. My name is Chris Widell and I'm AARP's Associate State Director for New York City. I decided that AARP should testify today to once again stress the urgent need for affordable housing in the Bronx and across the city. In particular, I wanted to highlight the need for affordable senior housing. Many older New Yorkers are having trouble paying their rent as incomes are outpaced by the rising cost of housing across the city. Back in 2004, we surveyed uh, New York City voters age 50 and older, and it shows that affordable housing is a major concern for 54% of respondents, far surpassing other community concerns like traffic, crime, personal safety, public trans or public transportation. In communities of color, this number was even higher. 59% of black voters and 67% of Hispanic voters identified housing as a major concern. Last year, we commissioned another survey of New York City voters, this time expanding the pool to include the Gen X and, boom and Boomers. Uh, why is Gen X important? Well, uh, the first uh, Gen, uh, Gen X, as my generation, did turn 50 two years ago. Um, Again, affordability over housing was cited as a top concern with 62% of boomers and Gen X respondents expressing anxiety over their ability to afford housing in the future. This continues to be a concern for communities of color when you combine the boomers and Gen Xers with over 70% um, uh, uh, citing worry that their ability to pay their rent or mortgage uh, in the coming years. These concerns have potentially devastating effects for New York City's population and economic growth as 61% of Gen X and Boomers said that they are considering leaving New York State to retire somewhere else because, the lack, uh, because they lack access to affordable housing. Our 2014 survey uh, also uh, of 50-plus 50, uh, 50 New York City voters uh, showed that 90% of respondents that 
it was important for them to be able to stay in their homes, in their communities at the, as they age. In that same survey, 73% of respondents noted that it should be the top priority for public officials to create age-friendly communities. At the center of those age-friendly communities is affordable senior housing that has appropriate services that allow people to age successfully. So I just want to leave you with a stat. Keep in mind that in December of 2014, the last of the baby boomers turned 50 representing a massive demographic shift. 31% or about 2.6 million of all New York City residents are age 50 and older. 13% are 65 and older and 65% of the population is expected to increase to 16%. The 65 plus percentage of the population is expected to increase to 16% by 2030. Across the country, every day, 10,000 people turn 65 years old. This, is this has been happening for 10 years and will continue to happen for the next 10 years. Simply put, New York City is aging quickly. We need to do more to make sure that the Bronx and the rest of the New York City have affordable, appropriate senior housing that is part of an age-friendly community where older New York City residents can age successfully in place. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all for your testimony. All right, we'll call the next panel. All righty, Mel Melissa or Melissa Lashley, Speaker of Foy Better Bronx, Tasmir Gatners on behalf of Barbara Ashleens, Ash Askins, on behalf of Barbara Askins, Talia Lopez, Reverend Carol Hamilton, and Pamela Hamilton Johnson. So I'll say that again, Reverend Carol Hamilton, Pamela Hamilton Johnson, Talia Lopez, Tasmir Gatners on behalf of Barbara Askins, and Melissa Lashley. Oh, Melissa, Melissa. Already. Uh, uh, you'll just state your name for the record uh, and who you're representing, and then you may begin your testimony. Hi, good morning. My name is Tashmir Gathers, and I'm testifying on behalf of Barbara Askins, the president of the 125th Street Business Improvement District. Um, Drew Greenwald, the principal, reached out to the bid immediate after the Harlem USA project was completed in his quest to understand the role of the community groups and the role that they played in community building. After that initial meeting, he immediately became active on the board of directors. His company has been immensely supportive through leadership, visioning, providing additional resources above the bid taxes, and more importantly, patient and understanding that community building is a long time commitment. Over the years, and along with Scott Alster, they have served in leadership roles as officers, head of streetscape and real estate development committees, and is driving the force of the bigger picture for the items of the bid. It was grid properties that was the forefront of pushing the bid to not settle for any street light fixtures, but to work closely with the city and to make sure that we got all that was needed for 125th Street. It took 17 years, but the result was 125th Street receiving the first LED lights in a commercial district in New York City. It was great properties that recognized that housing was a need with rezoning of 125th Street, but an equal and more important role was for culture to have a permanent position in shaping the future. He also understood that the city had to meet the developers halfway so that a real offer was available to create opportunities for those in the arts and the business improvement district. Through numerous meetings with the bids consultant, property owners, community groups, and the city planning department, the birth was given to the first cultural bonus for economic development in New York City. It was grid properties that realized that an oversight had occurred with the 2007 rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. I'll allow you to wrap up. Just, just um, I just have one last paragraph to okay. read. Sure. 
Those were just a few examples of the results that were achieved with working with a partner such as Grid Properties. Though their commitment was, a, was great in community involvement, their willingness to get it right and get it right into the mix of things and their great knowledge of urban planning, I see the Bay Chester Square project a plus. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You may begin, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you'll hit your mic. Not hit it, but press it. Okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pamela Hamilton Johnson. I am in opposition of the Baychester Square Mall. When I looked at the perspective from the um, website, it said that 280,000 cars go through I-95 every day. 190,000 cars go through the Hutchison River Parkway. So when we talk about congestion, there's going to be a lot of congestion in, in also the trucks that are going to make deliveries, the people that are there, and I just don't understand how you could have any more malls. We are super saturated with malls. What we really need are more schools. In District 11, I'm a former school board president, and we have kids that are still in the trailers that have rodents, that have mice, that have roaches in it. That would be a wonderful, wonderful place to, re to leave um, overcrowding in our schools. I would love to see another facility for that. But when we talk about the grand scheme of Co-op City and we talk about the, uh, the location and the proximity of the mall, you forget that they also propose to have an MTA train station behind Section 5. Now a waterfront, now a new mall. We just can't take it anymore. That we will not be able to get to our place of business, our place of employment in Co-op City. We have to take a look at it, not just the mall, but the grand scheme of everything that's coming into that district. Yes, we, knew we need senior housing. However, we need low-income housing as well for the, for the residents in our community. It falls on everyone that's there to be able to have a place to live. When it comes to shopping, I've heard our seniors say, I shop online. I don't need to go to a mall. I can order it and have it delivered to my house. So that's another um, reason why we don't have it. They mentioned that $2 million comes from Ridgewood. Ridgewood, Ridge Hill. Ridge Hill um, is now losing their, um, their um, merchants. They lost um, the um, companies that they've had. So if if you're trying to build a mall, let's just take a look at the national average and across the nation, malls are failing everywhere. And if they're looking to Ridge Hill to get their customers, you need to look again because Ridge Hill is losing their merchants. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I want to thank everyone here for showing up today. Um, I also want to thank our council member, Andy King, for listening to our concerns and also being open-minded to our comments. Thank you very much. We appreciate your support. Um, my name is Melissa Lashley. I am the executive director of Speak Up for a Better Bronx. We are a nonprofit organization that was formed by local citizens and businesses to raise awareness on the issues of traffic and air quality in the Northeast Bronx. We have over 70,000 people that have signed a petition opposing this proposed development. Too often, developments like this one go up through our community with little or no input from the community because no one knows about it. We're here to say that that's not the case. Five years ago, when this RP was put out, the community should have been aware and informed. To the MTA representative here, we are your consumers, we are your customers. To the EDC, we are your taxpayers. Where was the community engagement then? Why did we not have a seat at the table five years ago? These developers want to bring additional traffic from outside the community into our seriously congested local roads operating in a, in a community that is already overburdened with pollution and where residents suffered elevated asthma and respiratory problems. I myself has asthma. We don't need that. The Bronx has one of the highest asthma rations in the, in the nation. How about a plan that will benefit community like recreational centers, a park, a school, affordable housing for everyone, not just 180 units? We don't need another large retail project. We need a purposeful development that will benefit the community, not something that will disrupt the dozens of residents who already fight their way through congested streets, intercession, and highways each day. Also, when you bring in more vehicles, the air pollution goes up exponentially. Traffic congestion also adds to the idling of cars and trucks. Five months ago, I was nine months pregnant with my 10-pound-old son. I, was, <laughs> I couldn't walk. I had my ankles were swollen, my legs were swollen, but I was waddling my way through the community. And I was still advocating raising awareness in community board meetings, in recreational centers, in our schools. Yesterday, sadly, my grandmother passed away. 
She's a lifelong resident of the Bronx, and she had respiratory problems. I am here today because I'm passionate about this. Sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm here today because I'm passionate about this, this effort. Joining, to me, joining today with me are seniors, parents, young families, residents, and church members, and members from the community, from the community board 12, 11, 10. The oldest person that is joined with us today is Ms. Turner. She's 101 years old. <laughs> Hello, Ms. Turner. <laughs> She's a lifelong resident of the Bronx. Right, you could clap. You could clap for that. That's the only time. 101. Wow. All right, Mama Turner. All righty. Our youngest member is Aaliyah. She's two years she old. She doesn't look a day over 25 to me. I don't know. I don't know what that was about. All righty. Thank you so much. Our youngest member is Aaliyah. She's two years old. I'm urging you and I'm pleading, please, please do something about this impressing matter where, it's, where we can still impact decisions. We are asking our elected officials to do the right thing by the community. And now what, not what's the pockets for the MTA? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon members of the council, and everyone who made it here today to speak opposing what is affecting the neighborhood in the Bronx. I'm a resident of the Bronx for over 30 years, and as a homeowner in the Pelham area, Gun Hill area, um, I'm opposing this because we are raising our concern for the quality of life of our neighborhood. The decision that you will make here today will have tremendous impact on the community. Mostly, we are advocating for those seniors who made it out today on representing their community because as you see them, they're walking on canes, they have walkers. My grandmother is turning 90 years old, July 25th. Her legs fail her, so she has to use a walker. Um, she doesn't want any more noise in the neighborhood, and she has to take public transportation, mostly buses or accessory to make it to her appointment. So this is imperative and very important to help the community, especially for our elders. Yes, we do need public housing and affordable housing for the elders, but we do not need to um, decrease the value of the neighborhood. The people of the Bronx do not need worsened conditions. They need improvement, and the improvement is in the quality of life. And the quality of life for mostly minorities that live in the neighborhood. We are here today to ask you to please listen to everyone crying here today and advocating to oppose this. Thank you. What was your name? I'm sorry for the record. Uh, Talia Lopez. Talia Lopez. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Reverend Carol Hamilton. I'm a member of the Bronx for over 30 years. And um, just to get to the fact, let me cut through the fat and just give you some facts that we're working with. The developers said they're working steadfastly with the community. But I would like to ask them, the 70,000 signatures that we have, why don't they match it? Match the 70,000 signatures that oppose their project. That's working with the community. The developers said that there's $2.5 billion that's leaving the Bronx. That data that they supplied to us, it's a shameful data because that data was data that was used prior to Bay Plaza and the Yankee Stadium Mall being built. So those two malls will stem, have already stemmed that flow of money that's been leaving the community. Presently, we have the Yankee Stadium Malls, we have the Whitestone Mall, we have the Brockner Plaza Mall, which is over 213,000 square feet of, of retail space. We have um, up in Parkchester Mall, 
we have the, uh, the, the, the Gun Hill Road Shopping District. We have the Fordham Road Shopping District. Shopping is not our problem. We have 70,000 signatures of people that are in the neighborhood that are saying, we don't want this. I want to share something with you. Baychester is, is uh, Baychester, they're planning to build 350,000 square feet of retail space, which we do right across from Bay Plaza. Bay Plaza Mall has approximately 1.8 million square feet of retail space with approximately a little over 200,000 square feet that's still vacant. Ridgewood Mall is closing. They're having their, their, their clients leaving them. In our neighborhood, we have schools that, it, Harry Truman School, where our students are being housed in trailers full of rodents, not enough school spacing for our children. Ladies and gentlemen, the MTA has the money. We have the Yankee Stadium Mall, which is 913,000 square feet with a retail space, and it's not all occupied. They have vacancy as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality of the fact is this. You want to challenge this? You collect 70,000 signatures and match this and challenge this. We are saying enough is enough. If the data was correct, you wouldn't have to sneak, you wouldn't have to do it behind doors and come in and say, okay, we want this, we want this. Challenge the people, the 70,000 signatures that we have now, we are saying, we don't want this. Enough is enough. I hear my fellow colleagues said that the Bronx has the highest asthma rate. Let me correct you. The Bronx has the highest asthma rate in the entire United States. You're talking about bringing in more traffic. Retail brings more traffic than anything else. You're talking about the trucks that are going to be delivering the goods to the mall. You're talking about other cars coming in from out of state or other places to shop over here. The carbon emission is going to, what are you trying to do, suffocate us? We ask you, I look in this rotunda and I saw the sign that Lincoln said, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. 70,000 signatures have spoken. We don't want another mall. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank we you. want affordable, we want school, give me two schools on the property. Thank give you. me affordable housing. Give me some recreation centers and training centers for our youths who are leaving college and need some training. You know, come on, be reasonable. Don't try and shove this down our throat. We are gonna push back and we're not stopping here. Councilman, we're asking you, please, adhere to the 70,000 signatures that we have. That's the people that's speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. And I'll go to Councilmember King. I think he had some remarks he wanted to uh, put on the record. Is that the last one? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll wait to the end. Okay, we'll wait to the end. Okay, I'm going to go to the next panel. Anita Yvonne Middleton, there are six there. John Doyle, sure William Chen, Barbara Gibson, Dr. Dina Robbins, Hillary Bloomfield. So I'm going to go back again. Hillary Bloomfield, Community Board 12. Dr. Dina Robbins, Community Board 12, Environmental Committee. Uh, Barbara Gibson, Board 12. William Chen, John Doyle, and Anita Yvonne Middleton. All righty, you may begin. Is this thing on? Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, council members. Hello, everyone. Let's look at the intentions. The state your name for the record before of you begin course. as well. And I'll ask everybody uh, for the record, you have to state your name. Of course. And if you're representing an organization as well. My name is Anita Yvonne Middleton, and I'm here for it, Speak Up for a Better Bronx. So, the developers came, they spoke to us, it was lovely. But let's look at the intentions here. What they're doing is commercial. At the end of the day, 
whatever they try to sell us, whatever they try to tell us that we need or what they're trying to add on to, they want us to shop. So let's not forget the intentions above all things. Now let me start with this. My home is my temple and I want to go home and be at peace. Nothing but peace and tranquility. So when I hear a project that will cause more traffic, I am greatly disturbed. These developers say that they have spoken to the community, but let's face it, they were very selective in who they spoke to. Let's try to admit, but, but let's try to give them the benefit of the doubt. So when we ask questions on the process of what do they consider affordable, what their selection process is, they give no concrete answers. So speaking to members, selective members, is not really talking to the community. That's just playing semantics. But let's also remember this. They're speaking loose ideas with no real consideration of the locals who live and deal with the consequences every day with their retail. And lastly, not lastly, but second to last, variable, I like to call variable X, the unknown. They can make all these plans about where the traffic's gonna flow, where it's going to be, and how it might end up. But they don't know how it's going to turn out. The best plans of mice and men often fall astray. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Hillary Bloomfield, Community Board 12 Treasurer. Speak a little more into your mic, don't be shy. My name is, good afternoon, my name is Hillary Bloomfield, Community Board 12. I'm a member of Community Board 12 and the Treasurer of Community Board 12. Um, this project was brought to Community Board 12. There was some, some confusion at Community Board 12 how this project should have been addressed and it wasn't really addressed to the whole community in the beginning. There were some hidden agendas. However, my personal opinion, I'm against this project. Uh, I live in the community. My children at, attend school in the community. And my the people that represent the community is against it. It has too many different quirks. There's not a full disclosure of everything. And we need disclosure, we need transparency. We, we need a quality of life there. It's not going to be a quality for us. And I am a senior now, so I know what I want. I've been through the trenches, and I'm not going to allow them to build whatever they feel like building without talking to us in the right way. You cannot force things down our throat and think that it's okay. You don't live in the area, and if you did live in, you understand how we feel. Education is very important. Why did my son has to go to another school in another area down lower Manhattan? Because the schools were overcrowded up here. Another thing, we need some office space up here. Why do I have to slug all the way sometimes to Brooklyn to work or to lower Manhattan when we can have offices up here, city offices? Another thing that we need up here is a facility for communities where we all can sit down together and have some type of, I would say, um, for the young people, we need something for them, training. That's one of the things. I'm done. Thank you. That was good. Uh, thank you, Chairman Richards, and thank you, Councilman King. My name's John Doyle, and I live uh, slightly outside the affected area. And just to kind of sum up my comments uh, in a nutshell, I think we need another shopping mall in the Bronx like we need another hole in the head. And I think this is absolutely ridiculous. And uh, just I've, I've written to Councilman King in the past, so I'm just going to abbreviate some of my comments here. Primarily, I'm concerned with the additional traffic on Interstate 95, which is going to impact Community Board 10, where I live, as well as Community Board 11. Uh, there are seven entry and exit points within a thousand feet. This would add a lot of traffic to one of those entry points. Uh, 
And again, we've already identified that this, this interstate is one of the worst bottlenecks in the country. Why are we trying to drive more traffic there? This makes absolutely no sense. Beyond the interstate, I'm worried about the, uh, the impact this will have on both Pelham Gardens and the Allerton communities, which are quiet residential streets. To say they are quiet streets, frankly, is an understatement. I mean, they, look, they are very bucolic streets. It is amazing how quiet they are. And let me tell you something. As somebody who's to travel on I-95, and I know, Councilman King, you do as well, people are going to be taking those side streets to avoid I-95. That's just a fact of life. Everyone in this room knows it. And the fact that the proposal has not uh, allocated or even addressed that problem makes it so it's... Uh, unbelievable traffic plan. Um, I was even looking at this that the lack of adequate public transportation to this area is another problem and I was pretty much taken by the fact that one of the developers uh, uh, hired hands here said that the reason they weren't going to pursue the business aspects that the councilman proposed was because there wasn't adequate bu bus traffic. How does he think people are going to arrive at this shopping mall on flying pigs? Of course they're not. They're going to come in their cars. It's going to add to traffic in the area. It's an absolute travesty that this is being allowed to continue to this level. Um, I would say, finally, is there even really a need for this? Again, people have talked about this. Bay Plaza still has a lot of vacancies that are open, and I'm not letting them off the hook because they didn't adequately plan for traffic when they were expanding either, and I'm not on their payroll either. But there were issues with Bay Plaza when they were opening. It has not been addressed in this proposal. Throg's Neck Shopping Mall, which is close to where I am, still has a lot of vacancies, and they haven't even tried to start the Whitestone uh, Complex, thank God, because they realize the market is not there. They need to put this proposal, bring it back to the drawing board. It is unacceptable to many people who live in the greater Bronx area. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, uh, Bill Chen. I'm a Bronx, Bronx resident. I'm against this project and uh, the zoning changes that uh, are being asked for. First, I believe that the zoning uh, that is being requested for requires that the property border on two streets. One of the streets, and, and this project barely meets that, one of the streets is uh, the service road for I-95, and there's only one access point to the street from Bartow Avenue and I-95, which is already is a bottleneck and a congestion point. That street is a one-way street, one-lane street that empties out onto Gun Hill Road at the, the end of, the, of this, uh, this proposed project. So the only way out of this project is via Gun Hill Road, and that includes all the delivery trucks. All the traffic problems that have been talked about have been in the westerly direction on Gun Hill Road. My concern is the traffic on the easterly on Gun Hill Road. That leads to I-95 South, which we know is a bottleneck all the time, Hutchinson River Parkway South, which can be a bottleneck, but my main concern is that the other street is Stillwell Avenue. Stillwell Avenue leads to a residential neighborhood uh, that, is, that is primarily of homes, three adult facilities, a middle school. Uh, there are a lot of people that are walk, walk in the area, including the elderly and children. Um, and, excuse me, and it's a 20 mile an hour zone, but there are no traffic signals, so people speed through the area. I live in the area, it's, there's like four block long area that people just speed through before the first stop sign or any traffic control area. Um, one proposal that I would have is that at the intersection of Stillwell Avenue and Astor Avenue, right now it's a one way leading from Stillwell or from Stillwell to Astor, make that a do not enter uh, zone so that still that the traffic can go up Stillwell Avenue and uh, go out to uh, Pelham Parkway. Um, there's been talk about the, the about senior housing. The price of the uh, retail, the price to pay for the, for the senior housing is too high if the, if the price is that to, to uh, allow all of this retail space in there. If the plan is economically feasible with the amount of senior housing that is being proposed, which I believe is less than one third, then why not make the entire project senior housing? That's what's really needed here, not, um, not retail space. If I can make just one more, one last uh, point, your uh, counsel. This land is different because right now it's currently owned by the city of New York. The city can decide who it wants to sell it to, when it wants to sell it to, and for what purpose it should be made for. That should all be made with the, uh, the intention of the good of the people behind it. That should be made even if it m means letting the land remain undeveloped until that time for the right development can be made. The last point that I would like to make, Your, uh, your Honors, is that the city, instead of selling this land to the developers, should consider leasing the land to the developers in that way that, that they can c retain control over the uh, developer's behavior so that they should, re they should renege on any of these proposals that they're making that the city can still take the land back and make sure that the next developer does follow through what they say they're going to do. Thank you.
Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Honorable Andy King to the elected officials. My name is Dr. Dina Robbins, and I'm a lifelong resident of the Bronx. Just for a point of information, uh, my master's degree is in environmental health science, and I'm going to talk about the science part of it first. Now, when you build something, of course, you have to do your environmental impact statement you know, to say what are the, going to be the effects of everything that's going to happen at this particular site. So what's going to happen? Air pollution's going to get higher because of the cars. Sanitation, uh, the solid waste management. When people go to the malls, when you get your food, all of those things have to be taken care of. You know, the noise in the area is going to increase. Uh, the population density will increase. I think that uh, the moment I heard about this, I was totally against it. I didn't have to hear from anybody. I said, this is ridiculous. Because as someone mentioned earlier, you, I believe it was you, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but I'm still upset about the traffic that I encounter at going to the Baychester Mall, which I do love and I do support it. But it's a problem. It's a problem. Um, Another thing we need to know, in the valley and at that end of the Bronx, there's a problem with um, feces and urine backing up into people's yards there. You know, it's highly unsanitary. So if you're thinking of putting another facility there, you have to think about if you're going to put housing there, where is this stuff going to go? I'm just being real. It's going to go into the river, causing water pollution. And um, it's just a problem. So whatever we put there, we have to limit and we have to study how we're going to use the resources that we have there and how we're going to preserve this environment for future generations. I say no. And lastly, I go to Planet Fitness. I can't even get out of the parking lot, this, the traffic going. We don't need them all. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Gibson. It's a pleasure to be here with Councilman uh, Andy King and all of our community neighbors and friends. I'm going to come to the point, and the point is, that point is not the point for us. However, we wish for the MTA to look or be open to an educational housing complex on that, on that site. Board 10, Board 11, Board 12, we know what's best for our community. We say no to this project. Someone is not thinking, but we are. We, we know no changes or giving us this or giving us that is the answer to our problem no to this Baychester Square facility. That's why we're here today, and that's the results we want from them. MTA, we've been without it up to this point. We'll wait till you come back with an educational housing complex for us. Thank you all. That's the bottom line. Tenants, friends, associates, that's the bottom line. Thank you all for your testimony. I'm going to go to Councilmember King uh, for uh, a closing statement on this application, and then I will close out this hearing portion. Just real briefly again, um, I want to thank everybody who came out today. Uh, and I tell you this, we in the council have a responsibility to listen to our constituents. We have a responsibility to come up with suggestions and solutions to whatever issues we have, not just in our district, but the whole city of New York working with agencies and working with developers to make sure that we develop New York City responsibly. So with that all being said, to Grid Properties, I thank you for the conversations, EDC, as well as well as MTA, of trying to figure out what we need to do. The conversation must and has to continue, but as of we stand right now, I can only stand with my neighbors, my friends, and the community in the District 12 and beyond, and Community Board 11, 10, 
you are part of this conversation as well because this project would have an impact on all our neighbors in their backyards because this project is set in a neighborhood. So that being said, we're going to continue to have a conversation, but I didn't, we've heard you loud and clear, and we understand no means no, and we will do all that we can to continue to make sure our community is protected and we build it responsibly. Thank you again, everyone. All righty. Are there any uh, other members of the public who wish to testify on this issue? All righty. Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use items number 694 through 699. We are going to lay over both of these applications for future consideration. And I just wanted to make sure I put out there, ECF and Baychester are both being laid over uh, for now. Uh, all righty, with that being said, I'll excuse me to call the roll, council to call the roll so I could vote. This is a continuation of the vote on land use items 682, 683, 684, 689, and 690. Chair Richards. I vote aye. And I want to thank the... Uh, Oh. The land use items are approved by a vote of five in the affirmative, zero negative, zero abstentions, and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you, Julie. I want to thank all the land use staff for their uh, work today. I want to thank Councilmember King, who's uh, really been uh, showing some real leadership uh, with this application, and uh, we look forward to hearing from, uh, continuing to hear from the community, and we want you to know that we heard uh, and appreciated every, each and every one of you uh, for coming out today and voicing your opinion here. Uh, it says a lot, uh, and we thank you for coming out today. With that being said, this meeting is now adjourned.